Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Jennifer Smith. I'm the CEO of StopDistractions.org and co-chair of the National Distracted Driving Coalition. I want to welcome you all here today in person and virtually. I would like to thank all the National Distracted Driving Coalition members, all you attendees, the NTSB and Vice Chairman Landsberg, uh, NHTSA, and Deputy Administrator Shulman for joining us. I want to thank our presenting sponsors, uh, the Kiefer Foundation and Cambridge Mobile Telematics, as well as State Farm, who has generously provided Wi-Fi for us all. And so if you need to use that, the password is the hashtag tech to end dd with capital T, capital E, and two capital Ds at the end. Um, sorry about that. Uh, the National Distracted Driving Coalition was formed in March of 2021 to address distracted driving, which is one of the leading contributing factors to road deaths and injuries. Due to this road safety issue being a priority concern shared by so many organizations across so many sectors, a diverse section of entities representing academia, nonprofits, government, advocacy, and industry, including insurance, transportation, automotive, and technology, have come together to create a national action plan to tackle this important issue. You can check out our newly redesigned website at usnddc.org. You can go on there, download our recent reports, uh, get all kinds of information, and stay in tune with what we're doing and get involved. And we also would like to thank State Farm for their generous contribution to make that possible, along with many other coalition members. We're here today to discuss our most recent report on technology solutions to reduce distracted driving. Distracted driving is an epidemic not only here in the US, but around the world. But around the world, they've made greater strides in mitigating these crashes. Today, we've assembled leaders in the field of technology and research from across the country and around the world to share their expertise with us. I would like to personally thank Alexander Janik, who came all the way from Australia to share with us the significant progress that they have made in reducing crashes and fatalities and how we could utilize that tool here. Let's listen, let's learn about these tools and how they are ready to use now. Let's use this time we have together to chat, to challenge ourselves, and to plan our next steps. We must figure out how to accelerate the acceptance and adoption of these technologies to reduce the number of crashes on our roads and save lives now. I now have the honor of introducing one of Distracted Driving Community's biggest champions since his tenure at NTSB began. We are thankful to have the Vice Chairman's support and his leadership and his tireless dedication to putting forward solutions to curb distracted driving crashes and save lives. <laughs> so join me in welcoming Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you everybody for, uh, for being here. Um, I'm so proud of the National Distracted Driving Coalition because at NTSB, our job is to sort of present the facts. Some of you in this room will remember uh, Sergeant Joe Friday of Dragnet, who said just the facts. That's what we do. We don't get involved in other aspects of, you know, who's paying for what and, and so forth. We just deal with the facts. And we have a problem here, and we need to address it. And the whole idea behind NDDC is, um, we're not just going to try to solve this problem. As you know from Star Wars, there is no try, do or do not. That's what we're here for uh, today. So technology, what a great opportunity to solve the issue. Just say no doesn't work. We know it doesn't work with drugs and it doesn't work with the addiction that these things provide, and it is an addiction. They are designed to be addictive by the folks who uh, put them together. So every death and every injury from these crashes is 100% preventable. To my background is in aviation, and if we took the number of distracted driving fatalities and compared it to aviation, we would be losing one airliner a week one airliner a week 
for the losses that we have due to distracted driving. I don't think the public would stand for it, and I don't think we should stand for it either. I'd like to welcome Jane Haral from Brighton, Michigan. Uh, today is the fourth anniversary of the day that Jane lost her husband, Dan, to a distracted driver. And Jane, what we say here will not bring Dan back, but as you and I mentioned, he is here with us in spirit, and she'll have an opportunity to tell you her story here uh, in a minute. So we have other survivor advocates here as well, and to you, we offer our condolences. It's not enough. What we're doing here, once we are successful, that will start it won't totally compensate, but it will start to get us to the right place. Uh, we're also very honored to have Steve Kiefer, who's a victim advocate uh, who lost his son to, uh, to a distracted driver, and he'll be speaking to you uh, shortly. NHTSA, our fellow government organization who's responsible for regulating this, uh, did some analysis and they came up with the fact that distracted driving is costing the country about $100 billion a year. That's with a B. Now, I don't have that kind of money and I don't think any of us do. We need to, to deal with this. And if you want to solve problems, the deal is put it in economic terms. Everybody understands uh, the economics of, ha of how all of this works. So the crash data and comes from a variety of sources, uh, self-reported and uh, from some of the telematics. And you're going to hear uh, from a, a report today that the NDDC team and leadership have put together. And it looks at uh, crash data, arrest, conviction, naturalistic driving data, and self-reporting by some of the drivers who are willing to admit that they drive distracted. Uh, Robin Robertson, who is uh, our NDD, NDDC chair, is unable to join us. She's with the Traffic Injury Research uh, Foundation in Canada. But we have a couple of other authors of the study here, Charlie Clower with uh, Virginia Tech and uh, Larry Blimko with NHTSA, and they will help us to understand uh, what they've come up with. Technology has gotten us into this mess, and technology can help get us out. And that's what our second panel uh, is going to be about, about how technology can reduce driver distraction. We have Nina Gerson with MIT, Greg Fitch from Google, Mike Hernandez of Auto Innovators, uh, Ian Reagan with the uh, IIHS, JT Griffin of Seeing Machines, and they'll get us up to speed on what can be done. Now we're not dependent upon people's decision making or uh, the culture. We'll be looking at things that will actually make a difference. In our final session, uh, Ryan McMahon of Cambridge uh, Mobile Telematics and Alex Janik of AccuSensus will join JT Griffith with a one-on-one -on -one with distracted uh, driving tech leaders. So I want to just offer a special welcome to all of our tech leaders and again to all of our panelists. So let's give them a big round of applause. Now all of that's important, but logistics, lunch, okay? I know everybody's thinking about that or will be in a couple of hours. So we have some lunch options uh, downstairs uh, in the uh, uh, promenade and there are more uh, down on the uh, waterfront. It's just a short walk down there if you uh, wanna uh, go down there. However, we start up at two o'clock to look at the panel, or, or excuse me, the uh, uh, sh technology showcase. Don't miss that because that's going to show you how we're going to resolve this issue. It starts at 2 o'clock and goes until 4. And so now I'd like to welcome uh, Steve Kiefer of the Kiefer Foundation, who lost his son to a uh, distracted driver and is one of our presenting sponsors. So Steve, please come up and help us to uh, resolve this issue. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much.
Thank you all. And thank you, Bruce, for your uh, intro remarks and also for your tireless commitment to the, uh, the National Coalition. Coalition. Uh, we've really made some uh, great strides, great accomplishments in the short time we've been together, and I know it's only going to get better. I also want to wa welcome all of you in this packed room. I'm really pleased to see so many people in the room and online to um, participate in this, our inaugural event. This is the first time, and all of you are going to be able to say, I was there when it all started, because I expect it to be a lot bigger next year, and hopefully in five to ten years, it'll all be done. So let's uh, focus on that. Um, as Bruce mentioned, my name is Steve Kiefer and I'm the chairman of the Kiefer Foundation. The Kiefer Foundation was uh, founded nearly seven years ago um, in honor of my son Mitchell Kiefer. Mitchell was killed by a distracted driver in his uh, first month at Michigan State University. Uh, he was a young 18-year-old man um, in, his, in his first month driving up to Michigan State University and unfortunately uh, he slowed down for traffic and the young lady behind him did not. He was uh, hit by a, a young lady at about 82 miles an hour, driven across a very narrow uh, median on I-96 in Michigan and oncoming traffic and killed instantly. It, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how easily I can tell that story now because I've told it so many times and it still is uh, extremely painful. But what's even more painful is in the nearly seven years since we lost Mitchell, nearly seven million people have died around the world on the roadways of the world in, in traffic uh, fatalities and crashes nearly 7 million. In this country, over 200,000 people have been killed in that short time since we lost Mitchell. And it does not need to be that way. Now, I know the stats are all over the place, but I'll cite one. We, we know that about 94% of crashes around the world are due to some form of human error. And I'll tell you what it is. It's speeding, it's drunk driving, it's drug driving, it's distracted driving. And it's coupled sometimes with not enough people wearing seat belts. If we could address those issues, we could address over 90% of these crashes. So these are not accidents, these are totally preventable. And I think all of you, it, it's so nice to be with all of, all of you like-minded people uh, in the room and online because I know, uh, I know you agree that these, um, these issues are totally, totally uh, preventable. So today we're going to be focusing on you know, what we consider the most alarming highway traffic uh, trend, safety trend, which is distracted driving. And we're going to be talking about a number of technical solutions, uh, Bruce summarized some of them already, that um, can significantly impact this deadly behavior. And we're talking about technologies that are available today. This is not future technology. We're talking about technologies that are ready to be implemented, in some cases already being implemented today. Now, all of you know the official stats. The official stats say that 10 people per day are killed by distracted drivers in this country. We all know that the number is way underreported. In fact, my son Mitchell's crash was not reported as a distracted driving crash. It was not, and many are not. The experts, I'll, I'll say, would estimate the numbers closer to 50 people per day. Can you imagine 50 people today are going to lose a loved one to something as senseless and as self, selfish and senseless as distracted driving? So we have a lot to do. Now, of course, um, we acknowledge that there's many forms of distraction in the automobile. People will always talk about eating and talking on the phone and putting on makeup. That's all true. But we also know that the mobile phone is the single most uh, significant issue, and it really is responsible for the exponential increase in crashes and deaths. And as Bruce said, we believe that the, the, the cell phone can actually be part of the solution, and you're going to see some of that today. So I want to talk about just a few more examples that you're going to see today. Um, first of all, some, some very simple technologies that are already available. Do not disturb mode or driving focus mode on your uh, Apple iPhones. I mean, let me just see by show of, uh, show of hands. Does everybody have their do not disturb mode engaged on their Apple phone? It's so easy. And if you don't, please do it today. And please make sure every one of your loved ones has it engaged as well. These things work and they help. Now, uh, last uh, two years ago, the Kiefer Foundation uh, launched our campaign, which we refer to as Just Drive. We did this with the help of Tom Brady on the 4th of July weekend two years ago. And our message is very simple. When you're behind the wheel, put your phones away and just drive. We would prefer if that's all people did, but we do know that people sometimes need to stay connected. So if you must stay connected, there's so many tools out there that can help you stay connected safely. Uh, Tools that will allow you to keep your eyes on the road and hands on the wheel while you drive. Tools like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto that I hope all of you are using. Google Assistant, Google Built-in. And uh, as Bruce had mentioned earlier, I'm really pleased to have uh, Greg Fitch here from Google with us today. Where's Greg? Thank you for being here. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Um, 
The safe driving apps. There are so many safe driving apps out there, and I'll just highlight um, one right now that um, is available, and hopefully all of you are using it. All of the major auto insurance companies offer safe driving apps. These apps will help you drive more safely and actually help you drive more efficiently. Every insurance company that I know of offers these apps, and they also provide significant discounts. So as we talk about the phone being addicting, I've used these apps. They are addicting as well, but addicting in a positive way. I monitor every drive that I have, and I try to get a score above 90 so that I'll get a 30% reduction on my insurance rates. All of you should be doing the same. It's good financially, and it's good for, from a safety standpoint. I'm so pleased to have Ryan McMahon here from uh, Cambridge Mobile Telematics, and he'll be talking about this technology. And there's other apps that uh, you'll see that uh, can actually turn your cell phone into a dash cam and very simple, with very simple technology. These are things that are effective and are available today. Driver monitoring systems that use in-vehicle cameras to face the driver and face the road can be very effective at monitoring the situation on the road and monitoring what the drivers are doing. These technologies are in place in vehicles today, and by the way, are legislated and required by law for all new vehicles in Europe in 2025, 2026. So the rest of the world gets it. We need to be doing the same thing here in the U.S. And I'm so pleased to have uh, folks here from uh, Magna and from Seeing Machines to talk about some of those technologies. Uh, these technologies are saving lives now and will continue to save lives. Um, finally, uh, you got an introduction to uh, Alexander um, Janik from uh, AccuCensus. Um, he's here from uh, Australia, and um, their technology that he's going to talk about, uh, stationary monitoring technology that can pr provide real-time data on the usage of a phone or even seatbelt usage. This technology in Australia has basically eliminated distracted driving in uh, New South Wales. He'll talk about that. It eliminated distracted driving through this technology. It can be done in the United States today. This technology is available. We just have to get support for it. Um, I'll just, uh, to, to, since I haven't mentioned every speaker, I'll just say in advance, thank you to all the other speakers that will be up here. I'm really pleased to have, um, like I said, so many like-minded folks that are gonna be talking about technology and talking about innovative ways that we can bring an end to distracted, dri distracted driving. As you can imagine, this is extremely personal for me. I can't stand the thought of 50 people dying today. I can't stand the thought of another family losing a loved one to distracted driving. So while I'm inspired by all the work that all of you are doing and all the work that I've seen out there, it's not enough. It's just not enough. In fact, the latest data that we have says 43,000 people were killed uh, last year on the roads of the United States. 43,000 people, highest number ever, it's getting worse. So for all of our effort, it's getting worse. We have to do more, we have to double our efforts, we have to be more accountable for all this, we have to do this with urgency. We have to do it as though people's lives are on the line because they are. So what I would really like to challenge us, I would really like to challenge us to a real road to zero, a real path to zero fatalities. I'll throw it out because I like big challenges. I would like to see a plan that gets this country on a path to a 25% reduction in fatalities by the end of this decade. We're spending hundreds of billions of dollars to get on a path to get 50% penetration of electric vehicles. We can spend a fraction of that amount and get to a 50% reduction in traffic fatalities by the end of this decade. I know with this, this group and the people online and the leadership that we can get involved in this, we can put initiatives in place that can achieve that goal and maybe even go beyond it. So I challenge all of you to help support me on that. I thank you for all your support, and now really it's my, uh, it's my real honor to uh, introduce um, NHTSA Deputy Administrator Sophie Schulman. She's been a great supporter. She's going to deliver our keynote address. I appreciate you listening to my comments, and Sophie, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here. All right, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Steve. Um, you know, Steve and I were in Seattle just a few weeks ago for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's uh, You Drive, You Text, You Pay campaign. <laughs> Steve, um, thank you so much for your advocacy and for sharing your son's story. You know, I, I, as I mentioned in Seattle, I'm a new mom, and just the idea of your son's uh, story is, is so meaningful, and the fact that you're able to turn it into saving lives is, is so important. 
I'm pleased to be with you all today to discuss distracted driving. It's a critical safety issue on our nation's roadways. And Jennifer, thank you so much for convening this important national meeting and continuing to shine a spotlight on the risks of distracted driving. NHTSA is proud to be a member of the National Distracted Driving Coalition's steering committee and to join you in seeking solutions to this problem. Thank you to NTSB Vice Chair Bruce Landsberg for your leadership in forming the coalition and bringing together so many partners to create a traffic safety culture of attentive drivers. We have a good working relationship with the NTSB and always welcome their input. Distracted driving is dangerous and deadly. It's also completely preventable. When you're behind the wheel, there's nothing more important than driving. April may be Distracted Driving Awareness Month, but distracted driving is dangerous all year long. Earlier this month, NHTSA released updated numbers that underscore the risk of distracted driving. According to police crash reports, fatalities and distraction of affected crashes increased by 12% in 2021, making these deaths 8.2% of all fatalities reported. According to the police reports, in 2021, we lost 3,522 friends, family members, and neighbors to distracted driving. Their loss will have a lasting impact on those who knew and loved them. And I know many of you in this room have suffered such losses, and my heart goes out to you all. Sadly, these numbers likely don't capture the full extent, as we just heard, and it's difficult to detect um, distraction during a crash investigation, and so we know that police reports are likely to understate the incidence of distraction. That's why NHTSA continues to approach the problem of distraction from many angles. We recently published a report that found that distraction was involved in 29% of all crashes, resulting in 10,546 fatalities, 1.3 non-fatal injuries, and 98.2 billion economic costs in 2019, as you, as you just heard Vice Chair Landsberg say. Um, Larry Blinko from NHTSA's National Center for Statistics and Analysis will have more for you later today, including lessons learned from this critical research. These numbers are staggering, and the agency is committed to eliminating this risky behavior from our roads. NHTSA estimates that 42,795 people died in motor vehicle crashes in 2022. And while this represents a slight decrease in 2021, it's still far too high. NHTSA is committed to improving safety for all road users, drivers and passengers, pedestrians, cyclists, children, motorcyclists, older Americans, and people with disabilities. The numbers tell us that the United States has a traffic safety crisis. Changing this culture and saving lives will require a transformation and collaborative approach to safety. We can do this by embracing the safe system approach. This approach puts people first, where the system serves the needs of its users and not the other way around. NHTSA and the U.S. Department of Transportation are adopting the safe system approach, as are state and local governments around the country. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to look at the National Roadway Safety Strategy, which identifies action items for everyone working to save lives on the road and includes the key belief that humans make mistakes, but that those mistakes should not be fatal. We need to use the safe system approach to dramatically decrease the number and severity of crashes. The safe system approach means using every tool in our toolbox, including research, technology, laws, and enforcement to help save lives. NHTSA continues to engage in a variety of efforts to reduce all forms of distracted driving and associated crashes and injuries, including through our research. We are actively working on a comprehensive literature review covering multiple aspects of distracted driving. We're also working on human factors research to understand the relationship between distracted driving and technology, which I know folks will see more of later today. We have a new research project underway focused on distraction and driver monitoring systems. In this project, we'll examine several aspects, including new strategies to assess attention management behind the wheel. We're also interested in how deploying more advanced driver assistance features in vehicles affects driver's engagement and have several projects underway to study this issue. In addition to research, we're also considering ways to keep drivers focused on the road. After all, we know that many drivers struggle with the technology we already have, using our phones while behind the wheel. The pull of that text or alert is just too strong for many to ignore. Most phones today, as, as we just heard, have the do not disturb or driving features, which we encourage everyone to use. You can minimize the temptation to check your phone by using these features or by putting your phone in the glove compartment or in, the bag, in, in a bag in the back of your car. 
Take the phone out of the equation and you will significantly reduce the distraction risk and the risk of a crash. Vehicle safety technologies can also help protect those inside and outside the vehicle in the event of a crash. In fact, NHTSA is working on rulemakings to require automatic emergency braking, or AEB, in new light and heavy duty vehicles, including a pedestrian AEB in light duty vehicles. Once deployed, AEB can bring vehicles to a complete halt before a crash occurs and can dramatically slow vehicles down, causing significantly less da damage and injuries. We're also working on upgrades to our new car assessment program, also known as NCAP or the Five Star Safety Ratings Program. And we've proposed adding lane keeping support, pedestrian AEP, blind spot warning, and blind spot intervention to the ratings. All these technologies can help protect vulnerable road users who bear a heavy burden from distracted and other risky driving behaviors. In fact, pedestrian fatalities increased 13% in 2021, and cyclist fatalities rose by 2%. Many of these advanced driver assistance technologies are widely available in top models, but less so in more affordable vehicles. Including these technologies in our NCAP ratings will spur wider fleet integration. NCAP leverages market forces to encourage manufacturers to design higher levels of safety into their vehicles and make optional safety features standard. In addition to research and rulemaking, NHTSA promotes effective countermeasures to combat distracted and other forms of distracted driving. We know that strong laws coupled with fair and equitable enforcement not only help us change people's attitudes about safety risks, they help us change behavior. In fact, 25 states have primary handheld cell phone ban for all drivers. And high visibility enforcement is an effective deterrent to distracted driving. As I mentioned earlier, NHTSA just wrapped up our annual You Drive, You Text, You Pay high visibility enforcement campaign, which focuses on preventing texting and distracted driving. Today and every day, we thank our law enforcement officers for their dedication to protecting the traveling public from dangerous drivers. And we further thank them for their partnership and prioritizing equity as a foundational element in all aspects of highway safety. Many com communities are also using or considering automated enforcement, which I know is something that the coalition has called for in your recent report. From research, we know that people will accept speed cameras if they know the cameras are there to make the roads safer, not to generate revenue. For example, in New York City, we saw a decrease in pedestrian fatalities and crash injuries at locations with speed safety cameras. As cities adopt speed cameras, we encourage them to engage with their community, especially communities of color, to ensure these cameras are used fairly and not punitively. The goal must be safety, deployed equitably. And now, thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law, states are allowed to use NHTSA grant funds for automated enforcement in school and work zones. The law also initiated changes to the Distracted Driving Grant Program, making it easier for more states to qualify. All of these measures will help save lives. NHTSA is committed to working with all of our safety stakeholders, including everyone in this room, to stop distracted driving. As I've outlined over the past few minutes, there's no magic wand to solve this problem. Instead, it will take all of us working together on many aspects, including data collection, research, technology, laws, and equitable enforcement to change behavior and save lives. I want to take this opportunity to encourage all Americans to consider the lives of others while on the road and put an end to risky behavior behind the wheel, especially distracted driving. Remember, it only takes a moment to change your life forever. Looking away from the road for even a second can have devastating consequences. Nothing's worth the risk. Put down the phone and just drive. Thank you so much for your time today and for your commitment to this important issue. Thank you, Sophie. That was outstanding. Thank you so much for your leadership. It was such a pleasure to meet you in Seattle, and I'm just so glad you've taken the time to join us today. Uh, we had the opportunity to meet with Ann Carlson back in um, December and have a similar discussion, and I'm just so excited to have the support of NHTSA and uh, all of the passionate team that's here from NHTSA that I know is committed to a lifetime of making the roadway safer. So thank you all for, uh, for your support. I do want to take a moment now and introduce my good friend, Jane Harrell. Jane lost her husband, Dan, four years ago, as you heard, and she has just been an amazing, strong advocate, like so many of our victims' families, to tell her story, and I hope that uh, it has an impact on you, and I hope it motivates you to do more. Jane, please come up and please give a hand to, to Jane.
Okay, good morning, um, and thank you, Steve, the Kiefer Foundation, the National Distracted Driver Coalition, the NTSB, uh, NHTSA, and Deputy Administrator Shulman, um, and all of you for being here. My name is Jane Horrell, and today, April 26, is the four-year anniversary of my husband Dan's death. He was hit by a distracted driver on his bicycle in a Michigan State Park. I only have a few minutes, but would like to share with you how this exact day four years ago tragically ended Dan's life, changed my life, our two children who were in college, um, Dan's family, and our community's lives. I know Dan is with us today in spirit, so I'm honored to be here to share our unfortunate story. Dan, from a family of nine, had retired uh, December 31st, 2018, from the University of Michigan at the age of 62. He was spending his leisure time skiing, fly fishing, playing darts, cycling, oops, sorry about that, <laughs> cycling, um, and uh, was thinking of picking up golf again. Dan was really pure Michigan. On April 24, 2019, before I left for work, he said he was, was either going to play golf with his buddies, um, but he didn't know if it would be too cold, or he was gonna go for a bike ride around 3 p.m. if he didn't golf. I called him around 1.30 as I was going from meeting to meeting. He did not pick up, um, and later my neighbor said he was, um, our neighbor said he was filling up our bird feeders and taking the do two dogs for a walk. He didn't carry his phone on his person everywhere, so it was not uncommon for him not to answer. He was an accountant, and uh, if I recall correctly, I don't think he even got a cell phone until 2008. I, on the other hand, was a test case for my company back in the early 90s when cell phones became, began to hit the market. Um, and Dan was my balance, and I always wish I could have been more relaxed like he was. At 3 p.m. on April 24th, I received a call from Dan. He knew I was meeting with new people. Um, I did not take his call, but assumed he was letting me know he was going for a bike ride. I really wish I would have taken his call, and I think about this every day as maybe I could have changed the timing of him being hit. Dan's life changed at 4.27 p.m. the 24th. At 5.30 on the 24th, I was driving home, and I called Dan to see what he wanted to do for dinner. The phone was answered with, University of Michigan emergency room. I asked if this was a joke, and I learned it was not. I asked what happened and they said Dan was involved in a crash and that I needed to get to the hospital as soon and safely as possible. I was frantic. You see, Easter Sunday was the previous weekend and Dan and I and the kids were at my aunt's house for Easter dinner with cousins, my sister and her family. We were discussing one of our neighbors who was 96 and not mentally sound and Dan made a comment to everyone that Jane knows if something happens to me and I cannot feed myself, or take care of myself, she knows to pull the plug. I was praying that Dan would just have broken his arm or leg or something non-life-threatening as I so distraughtly drove to Ann Arbor. I called one of our neighbors to see if she would feed and take our dogs out. I called Dan's brother, who was seeing, he was local, he was seeing patients in his office. Dan was supposed to be, play darts that night, as he did every Wednesday night. I had to call his buddy and let him know Dan would, would not be there. I was so distraught. I went straight to the hospital where I learned Dan was not yet conscious. I did not get to see him until 8.30 or so. It was bad. When I was able to see him, I had never seen anyone with so many contraptions on them in a hospital. We were told to get our children there as quickly as possible. Dan's family from Florida began the drive to Michigan. My family in Michigan and Pennsylvania started their drive to Ann Arbor. Dan's brother went to Kalamazoo to get Megan. Dan's brother-in-law went to Big Rapids and got Pat. I think it was around two in the morning when the kids arrived. Dan's brothers and sister arrived around 6 a.m. It was now April 25th. Dan was on a ventilator, had a severed spinal cord, punctured lung, and had a stroke due to a main artery issue in the back of his head. When Dan became conscious, I told him I loved him. A tear rolled down his cheek. He knew we were there. Dan could blink his beautiful blue eyes and answer questions. One blink for yes, two blinks for no. Are you in pain? No. Can you hear and see everyone is here to visit you? 
Yes. Everyone that traveled to see Dan was able to see him. Late the afternoon of the 25th, things started to change. The nurses brought in clay plaster so that Megan and Pat could make handprints from their dad's hands. How did this all happen? Dan went for a ride in the, in the park. We had received a little bit of hope from the clinical doctors, but then this diminished quickly when the real doctors came in and they said he was totally paralyzed, would need a feeding tube, etc. Oh my gosh, how did this happen? They asked if Dan was an organ donor, and he was, so we set this in motion, and they were looking for matches. Then early the morning of April 26, Dan's blood pressure started to drop. They got it back up with medicine, this happened twice, and then we were told his organs were shutting down, and we were told he was no longer able to be an organ donor. The wee hours of April 26, the nurses broke a rule for Megan, Pat, and me. They brought in lounge chairs so we could sleep in Dan's room. Pat played Dan's playlist of his favorite music. The hospital priest did last rites for Dan. Dan was now unconscious. Our families were able to say goodbye to Dan. His blood pressure dropped so low that we had to prevent his suffering and we made a decision to let him go. We took Dan off the ventilator at 6.20 a.m. and he died at 6.30, April 26, four years ago today. The kids and I go home around 8.30 a.m. without their dad forever, so final. The dogs, they were in a, a daze. I took Trooper out and he just fell over on the walk. Life would never be the same. The kids went into their room and slept and cried. I sat on the couch and cried. What were we going to do? I went to take a shower, and on Dan's side of, Dan's side of the bed were his shorts, where he just left them, as he always did, and got into his bike shorts. I remember thinking again, he just went out for a bike ride in the park. How could this happen? We went through the motions of planning a funeral. Our friends from all over the country were coming. This was not what we had planned. After the funerals, Dan's bike shop had the first memorial ride of many. The kids went back to college and had issues getting out of bed. I had to be strong, but this was so not supposed to happen. Although it happens every day until it happens to you, you have no idea what it's like. I wanted the world to stop just for a moment, but it didn't. On Megan's college graduation that Father's Day, we brought Dan's ashes to dinner with us. We were trying to bring normalcy and Dan's family and my family were fabulous in supporting this. Pat was struggling and still is as he lost his best friend, his dad. We see signs from Dan that he's watching over us. On Pat's and my first trip up north to the house that Dan and I were to retire to, we heard Rita Wilson's Throw Me a Party song. On the way home, passing through Grayling where Dan's hunting and fishing property um, were that he had purchased prior to our marriage. I had tears rolling down my cheeks. The lyrics are, so when I'm gone, throw me a party. You should dance as if I was there. Don't be sad or be broken hearted. Just send your voices up in the air. Sing my songs and light up the sparklers. Tell my stories and drink all my wine. And know that my life is just getting started. The hardest part is knowing that you'll miss me. When we got home, I purchased the song and found a bit of comfort that day. as that day, when it came on the radio, Dan was speaking to us. He was letting us know he was okay. Earlier this month, Megan and I were discussing that it's hard to believe four years have passed without her dad. I shared that I was beginning to feel somewhat normal again. Megan said it is more normal, but it's also more weird personally. Like this is my this is the way my life is going to be from now on, and eventually there will be more years without him than with him, which is just a weird normal compared to the normalcy I had that day, April 26th. Dan was the most kind, patient person I have ever known. Um, I wanna thank you for taking the time to listen to Dan's story today. I know your work and technology being brought forth today and in the future will help prevent distracted driving and the senseless death, deaths like what happened to my Dan. Thank you.
well. Jane, thank you so much for sharing that story. It's, it's so hard to hear, and I, I would just, um, we know Dan's with us today. I would just ask all of you as you, uh, as you think about today, think of Dan, think of Mitchell, and think of the 50 people that are beginning those stories today. Imagine that. Today there's another 50 stories that'll be just like Dan's story. We have to do better. So to help us do better, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Smith. I think Jennifer Smith's going to come up and kick off our first panel discussion. So now I would like to welcome our first panel up with uh, Dr. Charlie Clower and Dr. Larry Blinko. Uh, Robin Robertson was not able to make it, but that just gives us extra time with these two brilliant researchers that can share with us. You know, if any of you know me over the last 15 years since I lost my mom, I have been screaming about data. We are the, the families, we were the data, we were all we had, but now we're finally figuring out how to get some better numbers. Thanks to these great researchers we have and we'll hear from them now, thank you. Excuse me while I reset up. All right. So thank you so much to um, the NTSB and the National Distracted Driving Coalition. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great, thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for organizing this. We're, I'm very anxious and very happy to be here. We, um, Larry and I are going to talk a little bit about prevalence data. And one of the ways that we do that, um, there are multiple ways that we collect data on driving behavior and driving performance and really trying to understand the impact of driver distraction. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but I'm going to really focus my efforts in um, talking about one particular method, which is a naturalistic driving method, where we actually put cameras in vehicles and observe drivers um, engage in a wide variety of different behaviors, not just distraction, but a wide variety of different behaviors and how those impact. Um, how those impact crash and near crash rates. So I will, um, I will get started. So there are multiple ways that we collect data, and some of those are experiments, some of those are observational studies where we have researchers stand um, on the side of the road and really observe and record the different driver behaviors that they see. Um, there are also crash databases, and so these are populated primarily from police accident reports where police approach or they arrive at a crash scene, typically several minutes to maybe hour later, and, re and basically report all of the things that they can see or that they believe um, it contributed to that particular crash. So experimental studies are done in laboratories, on driving simulators, in test tracks, et cetera, and we basically request drivers to do a wide variety of different behaviors at very specific times. So we can see the impact of those behaviors and how that may impact speed and ability to respond to surprise events, et cetera. But the problem with those types, of those types of experiments is that it is contrived. And we don't really know if those drivers would engage in those behaviors at all or if they would be engaging in them all the time. So the second way is observational studies. And these studies have indicated in the past that about 3% to 4% of young drivers and 2.5% of middle-aged drivers are using handheld devices at any given time. And you know, these, these data are quite um, very valuable, but they present one type of a snapshot. And these, because of where these things are located, we don't really have a very good sense of things on the interstates, for example, and on very high-speed roadways. Crash databases are done, are basically populated by police accident reports. And these police are very well-meaning, and they're doing their very best that they can. 
but showing up several minutes to an hour later after an, after an event occurred. Typically, if drivers are still conscious, which hopefully they are, but if they are still conscious, they, they may not be necessarily willing to say, oh yeah, I was texting right before. So that kind of information just doesn't get reported in police accident reports. So we really need much better prevalence data to really understand how often drivers are engaging in these tasks. So naturalistic studies have um, basically been around for the last 15 to 20 years. These studies are where we actually instrument people's private vehicles with um, data acquisition systems, and we allow them to drive as they normally would for a period of time, six months, 12 months, 24 months, whatever. Um, participants are told to drive as they normally would. They are not given instructions to drive in specific ways. The instrumentation is not invisible, but it's very unobtrusive, and it people do forget. I can tell you all kinds of stories that would curl your hair. They definitely forget. Um, but these types of data really provide very detailed information, both pre-crash and through the crash. And it really gives us an idea of what is happening in the environment around that vehicle and how drivers are responding to that environment and what they are doing in those seconds leading up to a crash, not minutes, not 10 minutes. 10 minutes on the roadway is an eternity. But those seconds leading up to the crash is really the critical component here. And that's what these data allow us to see. So one of the largest naturalistic studies that was um, that where we have collected data is was called the SHARP-2. So this is the Strategic Highway Research Program. Um, this was funded by the National Academies of Science. And it was the largest naturalistic study that has ever been conducted. So the data were collected between 2010 and 2013. Um, there were six data collection sites around the country, as you can see here, Seattle, um, Seattle, Buffalo, State College, Pennsylvania, Raleigh, Durham area, Tampa, and Bloomington, Indiana. And at each of these data collection sites, there was between 200 and 600, I believe, vehicles um, instrumented at each of those sites. So this re basically resulted in about 3,500 drivers, where we collected data from anywhere from 12 to 24 months, ignition on to ignition off. So the, these data acquisition systems have cameras, both forward, I'm um, looking out the forward view, but also at the driver, so we can see what the driver is doing. And also data acquisition systems and sensors so we know how fast they're going, how hard they're braking, how hard they're turning corners, whether they're crossing lane lines, where they are in space, so GPS, global positioning system data, a wide variety of different things. And so we have very precise information about these drivers for that entire duration of time. And these data will, will be very useful for many more decades to come. There are obviously limitations. Driving is changing very dramatically, and the types of behaviors that we engage as drivers is changing very dramatically. Um, but these data do give us a really interesting and profound snapshot in time. So again, this was a huge logistical challenge, and it was also very expensive. And so these types of data cannot be collected just constantly and, and continuously but we are doing our best to, to continue to collect data like this in smaller segments for various types of, of driver populations. So I wanna talk about two different publications or two different analyses that we conducted at the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Um, the first one, I will, I will just touch on a little bit, but um, Dr. Larry Blinko will be talking about that in more detail. And that was a, an article published by Tom Dingus and a lot of my colleagues at VTTI and was published in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science in 2016. And this is where they really looked at a wide variety of different behaviors, distraction being one of them, and calculated both prevalence and risk for the entire driver population of SHARP-2. Another article that I'm going to talk about or publication was conducted by myself and my good colleague, Fang Guo, at VTTI, and this one was published in the International Journal of Epidemiology. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically about this one, primarily because it breaks the drivers down by age group and looks at prevalence by age group as well as crash risk. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this prevalence versus risk quite a bit, but both are very, very critical components to really understanding where the problems lie. So here is one, um, one, I, one graph that talks about some of the prevalence, primarily of secondary task and wireless device use. And it's broken down by age group. And so these age groups are broken down by 16 to 20 year olds, 21 to 29, 30 to 64, and 65 plus. 
So every one of these bars, so all these bars are grouped in fours, and so youngest is the very early, and um, the oldest drivers are the very are the very last bar. So overall distraction, any secondary task, anything that someone may do, and by secondary task, I mean any task that is not um, necessary for the purpose of driving a vehicle. So this includes eating, this includes um, drinking coffee, this includes putting on makeup, this includes adjusting the radio, this includes any wireless device task, this includes talking with passengers. Any of those types of things, basically about 60% of the time our younger drivers are doing something other than driving. And it drops down a little bit for our older age group 30 to 65, so that's down to about 50%, and it goes down to a little bit around 40% for our senior drivers. So that those are pretty high numbers. People are doing something quite a bit of the time. Then we look at cell phone use. And for our younger age groups, they're, they're engaging in some sort of wireless device um, task about 10% of the time, according to our, our um, estimates here. And the middle age group, 30 to 65, is about 5%. And then older drivers, it's very low. It's quite infrequent. Cell phone visual manual tasks. I have split these out by cell phone visual manual tasks and talking, and I've done that for a wide variety of reasons, partly because of what we find with risk. But the visual manual tasks are any tasks that require the drivers some physical manipulation as well as eyes off road time, okay? And what we see here are that our two youngest age groups, 16 to 20 and 21 to 29, are engaging in those types of tasks the vast majority of that 10%. So around five to 6% of the time, they're engaging in those higher risk tasks, and, and I'll talk about risk here in a little bit. The older age groups much lower than that. Um, and then cell phone talking, our um, second age group, um, 21 to 29, is doing it about 2 to 3 percent, but we don't see a lot of talking. And this is one um, thing that, since I've been doing this for quite some time now, we're definitely seeing trends in what people do with their wireless device over time. When I first started this, I started with the 100 car study, which some of you have heard of, and that was a long time ago, but people were talking, and there was, texting was not a thing. Texting was not a thing when we started this. That's kind of scary for me. But now, texting is very prevalent, but it's starting to drop down. Talking is dropping. People don't talk, which is unfortunate when, I, when we talk about risk. People are now engaging in browsing a lot more and Instagram and Snapchat and email and all of these other things that absolutely require the eyes off the forward roadway and physical manipulation. These types of tasks are on the rise. And so these are the things that while we are talking about Sharp 2 and we're talking about data that you know is honestly a decade old now and we're seeing these risks, these risks are not getting better. They're getting worse. So when we talk about risks, you can ramp them up a little bit because what we're talking about now or what people are doing now are more dangerous than what they were doing then. Prevalence of secondary tests. So these are the other types of tasks. So people talk to passengers quite a bit, um, around 20 to 8, 15% of the time. Drinking and eating is you know right around 2 or 3%. Um, and um, center, Engaging with um, our center stack is also around 3 to 4% of, this, of our, our baseline segments that we see that type of engagement. Again, there are some interesting trends with the center stack as a lot of our more modern and advanced vehicles have moved a lot of tasks to the center stack that drivers must engage with. And so we are seeing a lot more center stack engagement in some of our more recent studies. Now I'm going to shift to risk. So what, oh, I'm sorry, do you have a question? Yeah. That's correct. Yep, exactly. But not everything. So yeah, it, it, um, I have not listed all the secondary tasks that, that included that. OK. Um, so now I'm going to shift to risk. Risk is, um, while prevalence is very important for understanding how frequently people are doing things, risk is how, how associated that behavior is with the actual occurrence of a crash. And with these. The powerful thing about the SHARP-2 study is that it was so large, we can really just look at crashes, and even the most severe crashes, to really understand when we see this behavior, how often is that occurring just prior to a crash versus when there is no safety critical event at all. 
And so that, that's one way we can calculate risk of these particular types of behaviors. So overall distraction, um, we see that basically these types of distraction increase risk by, by one and a half to two times that of an alert, sober driver. Okay, so that's what we're comparing to. We're comparing to a driver who is alert, sober, paying very close attention to the forward roadway. And so anytime anyone is engaging in any type of secondary task, they're one to two times more likely to be involved in a crash versus not. When we look at overall cell phone use, um, we see that our risk for our younger groups are higher than our, the risk for our 30 to 65 year olds. And then risk for our senior drivers is very high. But as you recall, prevalence was very low for our senior drivers. Prevalence for our younger drivers was very high. And so this is why I, I am very, very concerned about distraction with our youngest age groups. We typically, when we think about our younger age groups, we think about our teenagers. And we're very concerned because they're novice drivers and they don't have experience. And they're, they, um, there's a lot of things kind of stacked against them as far as safety goes. But these data are also showing that our 21 to 29-year-olds have higher risk and their prevalence is higher than our teenagers. And so this age group is still at great risk um, when we are talking about secondary task engagement and wireless device use. Cell phone visual manual is higher still, and it's higher again for our 21 to 29 year olds, so it's, over, it's six times. When they're engaging in a visual manual cell phone task, they are six times more likely to be involved in a crash than when they are alert and sober. And our oldest drivers, it's 25 times, but again, prevalence was under 1%. So um, we, you, we, that's why these, um, looking at both sides of this is very important. And cell phone talking, risk was only significant for our 16 to 20 year olds. The risk for the other age groups was, um, was not statistically significant. So cell phone talking, we're really only seeing risk for our youngest age group. And one of the reasons we think that's true is because when you're talking on the phone, you're still looking forward. And so they are capturing a great majority of the risk involved in driving. They are not scanning. There are risks there, don't get me wrong, but it's less than if they're looking down. Other secondary tasks that increase risk for our youngest age group, including interacting with passengers, which we have, we have seen that in, the, in um, previous research as well. We have also seen external distractions, reaching for objects, and operating in vehicle devices to also significantly increase risk for our youngest age groups, not for our middle and higher age groups. And the, our 21 to 29 year old age groups had highest risk on many of these secondary tasks. And so um, we really need to be very careful about this particular age group as well. So in, to conclude my portion of this, of this presentation, um, there are many types of secondary tasks that increase crash risk for drivers of all ages. It's not just wireless devices, but wireless devices has some of the higher prevalence that we need to be concerned about, as well as higher risk. And so that's why it's, it's such an important topic. Um, the risks of crash occurrence for all drivers, um, but especially these novice and younger drivers, is highest for those tasks that require the driver's eyes off the forward roadway and some sort of physical manipulation. And these results absolutely and 100% support full um, handheld bands for drivers of all ages, because while talking doesn't increase risk, they're not talking very much anymore, they're doing all these other tasks, and that's what really we need to stop. We need to reduce those types of behaviors for drivers of all ages. And I'm going to now turn it over to Larry Blinko to talk about his, um, his report that he released earlier this year on the societal impacts of distraction and crash causation. Larry? So about once every um, eight to 10 years, NHTSA re-examines the impact of motor vehicle crashes on society. Um, and we just published our latest version a couple of months ago. It examined the year 2019. And that study found that motor vehicle crashes cost society about $340 billion in economic impacts such as medical care, lost productivity, and uh, property damage. Uh, but it also costs society or about $1.4 trillion, $1.4 trillion in societal harm. The difference between those two numbers 
reflects the concept of lost quality of life. Uh, think of it as pain, suffering, value of life. There are, um, there are empirical studies out there that can be used to determine how much people actually put on, the value that people actually put on their life. And when you add that into the economic uh, impacts, you get up to a $1.4 tr trillion dollar impact. As part of this study, um, whenever we do this, we always look at behavioral uh, impacts as well. And uh, one of those impacts that we look at is distraction. Now, typically in the past, when we looked at distraction, we used police reported distraction as a basis for it. But um, as we all know, and as we've always been very upfront about, police reported distraction significantly um, understates the um, distraction that actually occurs. A lot of reasons for this. Um, one is that it's, it's just difficult to detect distraction after the crash. There's little objective evidence available from crash reconstruction. Um, you're relying on interviews or cell phone records. There's both legal and litigation incentives for drivers to not volunteer information on distraction. And if, of course, in fatal crashes, occupants may not even be available to interview. Police reported, uh, police reports detect distraction in about 9% of fatal crashes and 13 to 15% of non-fatal crashes, typically. Um, this has been fairly stable. It moves up and down and slight downward trend over, over time. Um, but for all these reasons I just mentioned, uh, we know that distraction uh, re in police reports is understated. But in addition to that, there have been some several studies, uh, Minet and Raja, two NITS employees in 2013, uh, did a study and um, Dingus et al., uh, the one that Charlie referenced, did, did a study in 2016, uh, both of which found significantly higher distraction than comes up in police reports. So for, the, for our study this time, we thought we'd, take, we'd try something different. Instead of using police reports, we looked at the Dingus study and we said, let's use naturalistic data. And we initially thought maybe we'd just use that, the, the data in the study um, as is. But as when we went through it, we f understood that it wasn't quite um, what it needed to be for, to meet our goal. Our goal is a nationally representative estimate of distraction crash causation. And there were good reasons why, for the differences at the time. But we, uh, for our purposes, we needed to make some modifications to it. The first issue was that the uh, 2016 study compared distraction to perfect driving. Um, we needed a study that compared it to real world driving. So what we're seeking is if you remove distraction from the equation and only distraction, then what, is, what does that do? What does that mean? Um, the other thing is that the 2016 study oversampled old and young drivers. They had good reasons for doing this. Again, they, were tr they wanted to make sure they got groups that they thought would be distracted. But for our purposes, we needed to be able to um, present a nationally representative driver age distribution. So we, would we needed to modify the study for, for both of those reasons. So we contacted uh, VTTI and uh, talked about it. And they agreed to work with us to uh, revise this study. Uh, and come up with a different model for it that we could use for national estimates. So we went ahead, so we revised the study and the new design basically revised the baseline to be real world driving instead of perfect driving. It looked at specific age groups to enable adjustment of results to be nationally representative of driving ages on the US roadway. We looked at teens, young adults, middle-aged adults, and seniors separately. Got separate odds ratios for each of those. Um, we looked at categories of distraction. Um, everyone is always interested in cell phone use, of course, so we wanted to isolate that, and we did that with a few other categories. And then we looked at crash severity. When we do our cost reports, we have, we break it down by fatal crashes and various levels of injury crashes and uh, property damage crashes. And so we wanted to find out whether there was, um, 
whether distraction is more important for one or more of these groups or whether it was similar. So after we ran all this, what was our results? We found that distraction causes 29% of crashes. That's significantly higher than the you know, 12, 13, 14, 15% that was um, in, uh, in the police reports. Uh, it, co it caused $98 billion in economic costs and $395 billion in societal harm, which, as I said, includes economic costs plus lo lost quality of life. We found that distraction from cell phone use caused 6% of crashes, which is about one-fifth or 20% of the distracted driving crashes um, at that time. This is an older study. It's certainly higher now. Um, when we looked at the uh, risk across crash severities, we found that the risk varied only slightly across uh, crash severities. Uh, with the central values for each category um, well within the confidence intervals of the other categories. And there was no trend. You might think um, there would be a trend as crashes become more severe, either up or down, depending on what actually happens in the real world. We didn't see any trend at all. So we concluded that there was uh, not sufficient information to discriminate the impacts of distraction across crashes of different severity and we applied the 29% equally to all, to all crash types. I just want to point out that there's a, um, the Minette and Raja study, the 2013 study that I mentioned uh, previously. Um, that study found that police reported distraction rates understated distraction by a factor of two and a half. And the value they came up with in their study which was done around the same time as the Sharp II study, was 28% compared to our 29%. So you have two studies using very different approaches that are um, coming up with very similar results uh, for that time frame. So there's some major caveats to keep in mind here. The first is that both studies, the, the, Raj, the, the Minus study and our study, our more recent study, are based on older on-road vehicle fleets from around 2013. Newer vehicles have more in-vehicle functions uh, for both practical and entertainment purposes. Uh, so newer vehicles provide more opportunities for distraction. But um, as Steve had pointed out earlier, there are lots of technologies that can be used in these newer vehicles to offset these, these um, temptations of distraction if, if people use them. The other thing is that cell phone use is much more prevalent today than it was a decade ago. Um, I believe the gentleman here from Telematics has some um, evidence of that uh, in, in their presentation. And uh, because cell phone use is more prevalent now, um, it's likely that, certainly that it would be a bigger portion of the total than we estimated in our study if this was redone for 2023. Um, but it's likely that the 29% would be larger as well if we redid it for 2023. Now, another factor here is that newer vehicles will be equipped with automated crash protection like automatic emergency braking systems. These systems will mitigate the impacts of distraction. As, they, as these come online in future fleets, um, if you are distracted for a moment or two, and you don't brake, your, your vehicle may brake for you and prevent the crash or mitigate the crash. So these two, th these two issues, the, the, these two changes in technology are going to have potentially a very big impact on distraction going forward. I just want to illustrate that with this graph here. Um, these are two lines representing different distraction technologies in the on-road fleet. It's important, we're talk not talking about new vehicles, we're talking about the on-road fleet, which includes all ages of vehicles out there, you know, 300 million vehicles. If you look at this, uh, at the lines here, the, the blue line represents um, touch screens. And I'm using that as a proxy for the uh, technologies that are, that are coming into play here. These started off as nothing more than rear view cameras, but they've quickly evolved into um, uh, massive, almost entertainment centers where instead of 
push buttons, you now have menus, and you have sub-menus within menus. So there is the potential there for more distraction, as I said, but if we can get people to use the other technologies in there, they can, they can offset that. The red line here represents the um, automatic emergency braking moving into the, into the fleet. So the two studies that, I, that, we've, that found about 29% um, distraction are off on the far left part of here. Um, they're conducted around 2013, and at that time, there was no automatic emergency braking in the on-road fleet, and there was only about between 5 and 10 percent of the, of the vehicles had touch screens, and even those touch screens were mostly just um, rear view cameras. By the mid-2040s, the entire fleet will contain both of these technologies. Uh, so by the mid-2040s, uh, the whole distraction pe picture may be completely changed depending on how these two things fall out. Uh, by about 2027, there's going to be a significant portion of the on-road fleet with both technologies. About half the on-road fleet will have automatic emergency braking, and about three-quarters of the on-road fleet will have touch screens and advanced technologies. I'm, my purpose in mentioning this is that um, we think that these types of studies, these, these naturalistic studies, are the best way to find out what's going on. And about three or four years from now, there's going to be a fleet driving out there that's very different, very different from the fleet that was driving when the last naturalistic study, the Shark 2 study, was done. So there's an opportunity here and perhaps even a need going forward to conduct a second naturalistic study at that point so that we can examine modern fleets and see how they're reacting to, or, or how they're interacting with distraction by drivers. And the one last point I just wanted to make is, whatever these naturalistic studies say, they only record observed distraction. Those cameras could see somebody with their hands on the wheel looking straight ahead, but if their mind is in Bermuda or wherever, that's not going to show up in a naturalistic study. So whatever we get out of a naturalistic study, even that is likely to be an understatement of distraction. That's it. Okay. Do we have time for questions? Uh, Jennifer? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Yes. Can you repeat the question? Uh, what are your slides? You mentioned uh, in-vehicle devices as oh. a source of distraction. Okay. What are some examples of what you consider an electronic logging device oh. as an in-vehicle device? Okay. So um, the in-vehicle devices that were that I put on that slide, those typically were um, center stack type things. So that's HVAC, um, air conditioning, heating, as well as radio um, and infotainment type centers, or infotainment type um, displays. So that, that's all that was. Um, that did not have anything to do with electronic logging. Um, we do have several commercial motor vehicle trucking studies that do look at electronic logging and the impact of that. And um, you, I can point you in the direction for some of that research if you're interested. Yes? You lost me on something. Yeah, you showed a graph that said that the newer Excuse cars me, Joe, will you go to the microphone right there? Okay. <laughs> Is it microphone on? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, you showed a graph that showed that newer cars more and more have touch screens. But are you saying that the touch screens are causing accidents? Yeah, but come back up. What we're saying is there is potential for those touch screens to, to cause accidents, depending on how people use them. If they try to use them while they're driving, going through the menus looking for something, whether it's a radio or whether it's uh, 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 Google Maps or something like that, that can distract them. 
Um, but um, there are, of course, uh, other technologies that can be used to have the opposite effect. So it's not really clear what's going to happen with those touch screens. It's just there's, they are a different environment, a different driving environment entirely. Okay. But is it fair to say, as far as accidents are concerned, the touch screens are not a positive thing? It, I, I would guess likely. I don't have guess data. Likely. I don't have data on that yet, but we could get data on that if we did another naturalistic study that, that, had, uh, that examined the vehicles that had touch screens. This study, there were no touch screens in this study. Okay, thank you. Yeah, over here. Um, there is data in, in, I think it was like two or three years ago, AAA with the University of Utah and David Strayer did a, did a study with about the top 10 or 15 vehicles with infotainment screens to test the cognitive overload of the touch screens and about every one of them failed. Um, they, he said that they presented more cognitive overload than Apache helicopter pilots had in 2000s where they had to redesign the entire interior. So the touch screens are definitely um, causing more distraction and eventually going to cause more, uh, uh, more accidents. And the BMW CEO actually said that he thinks eventually at CES this year that eventually the pillar-to-pillar the -pillar screens will be, will be banned um, with NCAP and things like that. But so there is data out there. Um, you can look at AAA and, and the University of Utah did that. So my question is, you know, how do you see kind of the NHTSA and other kind of organizations getting involved in, because it's kind of like the infotainment arms race right now, right? I mean, pillar-to-pillar -pillar screens, um, you know, Hyundai is going back to knobs right now because of this. Um, this is the same reason why they don't, they don't put uh, car, or, uh, cell phone holders in the car because they don't want the liability of it, right? So, but they will, they're willing to put a screen that's bigger than, you know, the one you have in, uh, in your house. So um, what's your kind of take on where, like, the kind of maybe government should get involved in, in that part of it? Okay, so um, that's a great question and very complicated. Um, that actually the very first panel session is gonna be talking a lot about this, and so I don't really wanna steal their thunder very much, but um, what I would say is that NHTSA has put out guidelines for um, how, these design, how these systems should be designed in vehicles and making sure that eyes off road time and total task time is, is reasonable. Those guidelines are in place, um, but they are guidelines. They are not requirements um, for these car companies. I also know that there are a lot of car companies out there who are doing their very best to make sure that these systems are safe, and we are all trying to do our best to make sure things are safe, um, some with better success than others. And as a human factors engineer, my goal is to make sure that the human machine interface is as simple and safe as possible. And we are working as <laughs> in, our, in my field as fast and furious as we can to make sure that that is happening. So, Agreed, we are not where we need to be by any stretch of the imagination, but we are hopefully headed in the right directions. Any other questions? There was a question from online earlier oh, when you great. were speaking, Charlie, from Lila, excuse me if that name is wrong. She said, I am surprised by the 15 to 20 percent prevalence of talking to passengers in Sharp 2. Is this only for cars with two or more people? My impression is that the vast majority of cars on the road have only one person. So, yeah, that is a great question. Um, so, kind of backing that up, um, yes, this is, but it, we, the percentages are still from the broad um, po population of control segments. So, whether there was passengers or not, it's still, um, the, the denominator is still the same. Um, Typically, we see about 30 to 40 percent of the trips have some sort of passenger, and that's higher for younger drivers. And as you saw, that the prevalence of talking to passengers was also higher for younger drivers. So there's, she is correct that there there is some, there is a kind of a denominator um, bias in there. Yes. Yes. Please use the microphone so that our online um, listeners can hear you. It's a question for Charlie. Okay. Uh, so half of the states have cell phone laws mm -hmm. and the other half don't, right? So similar to when the FBI takes over, the feds take over, when there's interstate things going on, can't there be, maybe based on the fact that you have highways, like I'm, I'm from Delaware, Delaware Safety Council, so we have I-95 that goes through our state. So to incentivize maybe the other half of the states who should but don't have uh, bans on cell phones in their cars. Isn't there something nationally 
or, or federally that could be done maybe using the interstate <clears throat> highways can't use your phone on them as a start like how do we get the other half on board because that half is not acceptable. <laughs> that, that is a great question. Um, I am an academic, and <laughs> so <laughs> let me start the conversation there. Um, um, you know, I, I don't know what it's gonna take, but I do believe that we have made huge progress in getting those 50 on board. If you look to our north, our neighbors in Canada, they've had, they have had a federal ban since 2009. I mean, and their prevalence, I've, we have data to show, is much lower than in the U.S. So we know that cell phone laws work. I, the U.S. is slowly catching up. Oh my God, we're getting there. Chug, chug, chug. Um, and hopefully we can continue to uh, make progress in those other 50, in the other 25 states. Well, I'm um, suggesting that it starts with highways because I figure if you get federal dollars for your highways, and just maybe start there. Like if I you think don't adapt a law, then you don't get the money for the highway. So do we have anyone in the room that's got uh, knowledge on state versus uh, federal traffic laws? You might want to comment. I can add in on that. Um, since in my experience doing this over the last 15 years, that we have to get the state's laws because of states' rights. Going to do like the, it's the carrot or the stick. That was the old days when I first lost my mom. We did have the stick bill in Congress. It won't move, it won't pass. It's, there's just no way to get it through. Of course, we're gonna keep trying, but yes, withholding federal dollars like in the old drunk driving days because we model everything we do after those same efforts. But again, it's, that would have to get through Congress. So, okay. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. Why, why are there only a couple of naturalistic studies? Why, why are they so out there? So the question is, why are there only a couple of naturalistic studies, and why are the ones that we reported on today so outdated? Again, a lovely and great question. Um, but first of all, like the Sharp 2 study, for example, um, 3,500 drivers, it's logistical challenge. It's very difficult, challenging, very expensive. So it's very resource intensive in order to collect that data, but also to analyze and code that data. So that's part of the reason why there are so few. Um, we do have more studies ongoing that are at, on a much smaller scale. Um, so there are pros and cons to that. So we do see driver behavior as we're moving forward and we are still collecting data in, that, in, these, um, in this area. But because these studies are smaller, calculating crash risk is harder because we just don't have the data, the, we don't have the statistical power. So then we need to use um, other safety surrogates in order to calculate risk. So, uh, just to follow up, there, there's a lot of organizations, dash cam companies out there, mm -hmm. so on well. They yeah. collect this type of data. Uh, are you looking for contributors to, to help support future studies? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Any other questions? Yes, Ian. to 29 year olds that kind of flies in the face of the you know all the research that says driver experience uh, you know you see lower crash rates over time um, so if you did miss the first part of Ian's question he's asking why we saw high um, higher crash rates for the 21 to 29 year olds versus the 16 to 20 year olds and that kind of flies in the face of we know that crashes actually go down over time for drivers of older age groups um, I, um, I do have some thoughts on that, and one of them is that um, we crash rates for those age groups has actually been going up a little bit. So it, you know, it is lower than for the 16-year-olds, but it has been going up um, overall. And we also are seeing in other research, like the um, AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, their traffic um, culture, their traffic safety culture index is showing prevalence is actually higher. They're reporting their prevalence as higher for a lot of wireless device use and other risky behaviors. Um, why the 21 to 29 year olds are more risky and continuing to do risky behaviors as they are gaining driving experience, um, I don't know. Um, I would really like to dive in a little bit more and look at unwillingness to engage 
and some of these other more nuanced questions to really see are we not seeing improvements in willingness to engage in the higher risk environments over time or, or what is actually happening there? But I haven't had the chance to dive in. So good questions, but it is concerning. Yeah. Yeah, just an observation on that. We did a study with a major fleet in North America and found that at five to seven years of employment, there's actually a complacency factor. So we actually saw the incidents actually go up at that level. And so we're presuming that's from complacency become they become really comfortable and confident. And so they actually start to do other things. And so just a, a correlate to that, that's yeah. what we saw with the can you fleet. Can you tell us your name and where you're from? Oh, hi, I'm Bill Bland. I'm actually from Canada. We drive well, uh, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Canada. Uh, and I'm with a company called Medidas Technologies, so Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes, so they're, they're, that's a really good point. Larry points out that the 21 to 29 year olds have a lot better access to alcohol and that could be playing a role. Yes. And Jennifer, you're gonna need to cut us off when, <laughs> when it's time. Because I don't have a, I, my clock is not up here with me. Thank okay. you both for your presentations. Um, Charlie, I'm gonna ask you to continue to speculate. And um, <laughs> Larry brought up, and, and I know you, you th this is true, the, the data on which we're, we're talking about is, is older information. And in your presentation, there was a lot of difference with the older drivers. Mm -hmm. um, you broke it down by age group. And I just wonder in 2013, when this data was collected, um, the prevalence of cell phone use and smartphones was lower overall, but certainly I believe lower in that older population. Mm -hmm. And so can you speculate as to what the data would look like if we had kind of the cell phone and smartphone penetration that we have today in some of the, the older populations in the, in the naturalistic driving study? And I know it's, it's really asking you to guess. Yes. Um, so, no one quote me. Um, <laughs> it's not being recorded or anything. <laughs> <laughs> right, or, you know, 300 people listening. Um, I... My, my, my guess is, is that we will continue to see increases across the board because um, as, as our population ages, more and more of us have been using these wireless devices for longer periods of time in our lives. And so I, I do honestly believe that prevalence will increase um, over time for all age groups. Um, but whether we get smarter about that um, and as we get older, and we, I also know that senior drivers do tend to self-regulate a lot better than other drivers and other driver age groups. And so these are, um, it, it's, it will probably be a balance, but um, the very low, like under 1%, I, I don't know if we'll see that again in the next 10 years or, or in even this population. It may be higher than that, but it will probably still be quite low. Thank you. I just wanted to add in my non-scientific approach to that. And I think that the pandemic and quarantines, when we were locked down and everything we had to do was through our technology, that that just accelerated our impulsivity to use our phones. And so now people that would never use their phones behind the wheel are doing Zoom calls while driving and not even thinking about it. Filming videos, truck drivers who have had the federal regulations against them for years, a decade almost, are on TikTok filming videos while driving. So it's just, I, our brains aren't getting it, I think, which is gonna scale that much worse. So I think the, the crash study that NHTSA done, the economic study, A, I'm just gonna not put Larry on the spot, but if you can do that every, more than every 10 years, that'd be great, because I think that's great data. <laughs> um, but when you're talking about the $98 billion of distracted driving, does the report break that down to the different distractions and how much of that would be phone involving phone use, or is it just a 98 billion across the board, all distraction? Uh, the, the, yeah, so in that report, we found 6% was due to um, f cell phone use. Again, 
cell phone use was lower in those days. But at that, in that report, it was about roughly 20% of the total. So 20% of the 98 billion roughly would be what, what that would have found for cell phone use. But again, today, if you were to do this study today, a new naturalistic study right now, I'm sure that would be much harder than that. And see uh, plug to do the study more than once every 10 years. <laughs> Not it, not, it takes not, it, not, it takes two we've years. We've had this discussion. It takes two so. years to do the study. <laughs> um, I'm an old guy, but I still remember Mr. Yaffe, who was my high school driver's ed teacher. Do, do you all speak with driver's ed teachers, and what do they say about this whole cell phone thing? So. I also do a lot of work with teen drivers and a lot of research in the teen driving arena. And um, I can tell you that, that distracted driving and certainly driving with wireless devices is part of most driver's ed curriculums. Is it enough? No, it's not enough. And so again, the panel and this whole meeting talking about new technologies and ways that we can really address this issue, I think that's our path forward. And, um, and hopefully we can make a difference um, using those new, these newer technologies and do not disturb and a lot of things that are actually available now versus things that are coming. Um, but um, clearly my data show that teens are driving with their, with their phones a lot and it is problematic. All right. Um, I think we will go ahead and take a break now, and we will reconvene again at 10.55. Thank you. We are going to get started with our second panel of the day. Which is titled, How Technology Can Help Reduce Driver Distraction. We have four esteemed panelists here today. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce all four of them, and then they will um, give their presentations in the order that I've introduced them. Our first, our first panelist is Dr. Ian Reagan. Ian Reagan is a senior research scientist at the in Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Since joining the institute in 2012, Dr. Reagan has conducted research on how drivers, sorry, hold on. how drivers use and are affected by portable electronics and in-vehicle technologies. His research includes work to understand driver distraction and identify countermeasures that effectively limit its risks. He also studies how use of crash avoidance and advanced driver assistance systems influence driver behavior and road safety. Previously, he worked for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration as a research psychologist, and Dr. Reagan earned his doctorate in psychology from Old Dominion University. Our second panelist is J.T. Griffin. J.T. Griffin has over 20 years of Capitol Hill and government relations experience. For eight years, he worked on Capitol Hill for a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee. And for over 13 years, he ran the government relations and communications department at Mothers Against Drunk Driving. In the fall of 2020, J.T. formed Griffin Strategies, LLC, a full service government relations firm representing clients before the federal government. He works closely with seeing machines to promote driver monitoring systems, which can detect and prevent distracted driving. Mike Hernandez is our third panelist. Mike Hernandez joined the Alliance for Automotive Innovation in 2021 as the Senior Director of Safety. In this role, Mike is responsible for crash avoidance and, ad and advanced driver assistance systems tech topics, automated driving, and international regulatory harmonization. Prior to joining Auto Innovators, Mike spent time at BMW, Toyota, and at NHTSA. And finally, Dr. Greg Fitch, who is the head of safety research Android Auto at Google. Greg Fitch leads safety research for Android Auto at Google, where he is working to create a safe and seamless connected experience in every car. He joined Google after working at Apple as a product integrity engineer, where he provided human factors guidance on the development of automotive experiences. Prior to that, he led the automated, automated Vehicle Systems User Experience Group at the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. Dr. Fitch is an experienced researcher of driver performance with technology. His past research specialized in driver distraction and driver performance with automated vehicles. And he received his PhD from the Grotto Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Virginia Tech in 2009. Welcome all panelists, and we will get started.
Uh, thank you for the introduction, Charlie. Um, so uh, in the, the few minutes that I have to, to talk to you all today, I want to focus on three different types of technology that are you know, really ready to go right now and could go a long way to combat distracted driving. And uh, the, the first of those is uh, kind of collectively what we're referring to now is do not disturb while driving applications. And they could really go, uh, do, go a long way to preventing driver cell phone use. Um, and you know, there's a, a big challenge right now with, with uh, getting people to use these applications. Um, you know, that, one of the most appealing features of them is that everything is, is, that's needed uh, to, to make them work is housed within the cell phone. You know, the, they use the sensors that are in the phone to detect that the, that the owner is driving. They can activate automatically. And the real beauty of uh, what these things do is to block the incoming notifications. And, you know, we know from, you know, tons of interviews that have been given by uh, developers who have worked for social media companies, they intentionally, you know, use the uh, how they deliver the notifications to the phone owners to, you know, really get them addicted to uh, their their social media apps and and what have you. So just being able to suppress those incoming notifications will go a long way to just keep that you know reflexive behavior by the driver to reach over and grab the phone when it buzzes or dings. That's that's not going to happen. Um, this, at this point in time, if you have a smartphone, you've got an app on your smartphone that you can, that you can be using for this. Um, and, you know, again, the challenge is getting people to turn them on. We did a study soon after uh, Apple released its Do Not Disturb While Driving app, um, and we found out that only about 20% of the iPhone owners that we polled had it set to turn on uh, automatically. And you know, one of the things that we, that we saw when we were doing that research is there's this you know, one strategy that's referred to as an, an opt-out strategy as opposed to opting in, where if uh, the people who are providing these, these apps, if they um, ask the phone owner to an opt out of having it turn on automatically as opposed to opting in to having it turn automatically, uh, you would get a lot more use. I mean, there's some research looking at um, how, how that uh, decision to use opting out increased the percentage of people who are willing to be organ donors. Um, you know, just, just switching opt out to opt in really bumped up the, the percentage of people who said they'd be willing to donate their, their organs in, in case of a, a fatal crash. Um, and I know that, that this topic is gonna come up later the panels. I know that uh, Ryan with uh, CMT is going to talk about how, you know, the telematics and all the sensors that are uh, built into smartphones can also be used to incentivize drivers to, to change their behavior as well. Um, but I want to take, you know, the, the next few minutes to talk about this next class of technology because, you know, at this point in time, it, it really is the, you know, as, as far as the Institute's concerned, the, the most effective countermeasure for uh, distracted driving at this, at, at, this, at this point where we are. Um, crash avoidance technology, um, it's it. And, you know, there's a little bit of a connecting of the dots that need to back up that, that statement, but, you know, the, the first piece of it comes from uh, naturalistic driving research that, that you know, the, the methods that, that Charlie was talking about earlier this morning where you, know, you have uh, thousands of people driving uh, their normal daily drives with video cameras and all sorts of stuff like that and you know, you're able to capture all the crashes that occur during you know the months that that data is being collected and so there was this study that was conducted and published in 2018 by the AAA Foundation and what they did was to calculate crash risk when drivers were engaged in visual manual cell phone use, right? And so what this, um, what this figure is showing is that when they calculated the risk of getting into any type of crash, you're the, when you're using your, your cell phone for a visual manual task, your risk goes up about two and a half times. It's a significant increase for 
compared to when you're not distracted at all. But they then went and they calculated the risk of getting into road departure crashes and rear end crashes. And they saw that you know, when you're engaged in a visual manual cell phone task, uh, the odds of getting into road departure and rear end crashes are much higher than getting into other types of crashes. So this study shows that you know, there's a really high correlation with two particular uh, types of crashes, lane drift crashes, rear end crashes, and visual manual distraction. So the next part of backing up my statement about the effectiveness of crash avoidance for distracted driving comes from work that we've done at the Insurance Institute to estimate the benefits of these systems. And so this, this first set of results is our uh, research looking at uh, the crash experience of vehicles that are equipped with some form of front crash prevention compared to the same make and model vehicles that have no, no front crash prevention. And what it's showing is that you know, passenger vehicles with forward collision warning alone have a 27% reduction in rear end crashes compared to the same cars with, without the technology. The biggest effect that we're seeing are for passenger vehicles with uh, forward collision warning that also add auto brake. They have a 50% lower rate of these rear end crashes, which are high, highly correlated with visual manual distraction. Um, we're seeing the benefits also extend to large trucks as well as passenger vehicles. And so, you know, we're, we were very excited, proud of uh, the 2015 agreement that we brokered with NHTSA to get all these automakers that are listed on this slide to agree to make auto brake standard by 2022. And you know, the, the majority of the automakers that are listed here met that mark and the, the few that didn't were, were pretty close to it. And so um, that being said, <clears throat> this graph shows that, um, you know, 2021, we have less than 20% of the, the cars that are on the road are equipped with uh, forward or front crash prevention as, as standard. And, you know, we know it takes about 30 years for once a, a, a feature becomes to, that after a feature becomes standard for it to really turn over in the vehicle fleet. So there's going to be some time before uh, you know, we get to that, that critical mass to see you know, uh, really substantial benefits. Now, lane departure warning systems, we're seeing a very similar set of results with lane departure warning as we are with front crash prevention. Cars that are equipped with lane departure warning are having significantly fewer lane drift crashes than cars that don't have lane departure warning. Um, you can see that the percentage reductions are smaller than what we're seeing with front crash prevention. Um, a big part of that is that we know that long running average, only about half the cars on the road with lane departure warning have the systems turned on. But we're still seeing crash reductions despite that. And so very similar trends in the percentage of vehicles that are on the road equipped with lane departure warning now. You know, there is the additional challenge of uh, you know, getting cars on the road with the technology. We also have to figure out how to get drivers to keep the systems turned on. And this graph is just uh, showing our sister organization, the Highway Loss Data uh, Institute's uh, estimate that you know, it's gonna take until uh, about 2026 so we get to a point of about 50% uh, of registered vehicles on the road that are equipped with these two technologies that are showing that they are reducing crashes that are highly correlated with visual manual distraction. Um, and one thing that could speed things up a little bit, um, or increase the availability of cars on the road with, uh, with this technology are aftermarket systems. Mobileye is one company that offered an aftermarket device works pretty well for basic warnings um, and a lot less expensive than replacing a, a vehicle. So I want to uh, finish up with, uh, you know, the third technology I wanted to talk about. Um, it's, it's automated enforcement. Um, you know, if we uh, really want to get serious about um, reducing 
particularly cell phone distractions. Well, this is untapped potential. But you know, talking about automated enforcement in general, and you know, uh, the the NHTSA administrator spoke a little bit about the safe systems approach. But uh, you know, thinking about um, speeding behavior, um, speeding is is its own separate pillar on the safe systems approach. Anything that that we can do to slow people down is going to be better for any traffic safety problem across the board. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, there's uh, something that NHTSA puts out uh, or has put out some fatality curves estimating the, the likelihood that pedestrians will survive crashes at certain rates. But, you know, uh, a pedestrian who is struck by a distracted driver at 35 miles per hour has not a lot of chance of surviving, but a pedest uh, pedestrian struck by a distracted driver at 20 miles per hour uh, may may live uh, and survive that crash. But you know, also from another uh, uh, broader perspective, um, you know, somebody who is speeding, driving unsafely, they're not really, they may not be aware of how they're driving. And this this quote that's highlighted points to that. And this is kind of a broader notion of uh, distraction. But you know, how attentive are people are, how attentive are people to their to their driving at a given point in time. This person says, you know, I'm not paying attention when I have other people in the road and I've got a lead foot, so I find myself driving faster. Well, people uh, pay attention to their to their driving on roads where there's uh, speed cameras in place. This, you know, speed cameras typically in the U.S. don't issue tickets till drivers are 10 miles per hour over. This shows, you know people pretty much stop driving 10 miles per hour over on those roads. Crashes go down as a result. There's bigger reductions for, for injury crashes in places that use these cameras. And after plateauing, um, in terms of the number of the communities in the US that were using cameras, it started to uh, tick up again the past few years. And this quick snapshot of states that are using speed cameras. So you can see there's a lot of opportunities uh, to uh, deploy more of this technology throughout our country. Is it the blue one or the gray one? The, the, the blue one, sorry, I'm sorry. The blue shaded states have speed cameras, the gray do not. And so it's a very similar story with uh, red light enforcement. Intersections are uh, some of our most dangerous points on our roads. Intersections that use red light enforcement um, have people paying attention there. Uh, red light violations go down, injury crashes go down, red light running fatalities go down. But uh, you know, I think there's been a little bit more bad PR with uh, red light cameras being perceived as like a, a you know a cash grab, um, maybe some other reasons. But there's a downward trend recently in the number of communities in the U.S. using red light cameras. And the the blue shaded states here are currently using them. Um, I thought it was interesting to contrast this uh, snapshot with the one. Uh, about states using speed cameras because uh, California, Texas, and Florida allow red light cameras but not speed cameras. And you know, I just think that's interesting. They're, they're three of our biggest states. They're on opposite ends of the political spectrum. It's just curious to me. But again, if we want to get serious about uh, reducing cell phone distractions, Automated enforcement of distracted driving laws is, uh, again, it's, it's something that's not being done here in the states, and it could make a huge difference. We see how effective it's been for red light and speed camera enforcement. It could be deployed in states that have clear prohibitions on handheld device use. AccuSensus is here. They've developed uh, a, a system that does this. It's based on overhead cameras. It's on, you know, they have it 
uh, unit on affordable trailers. Um, we did a test track study uh, comparing their system to a trained roadside observer who you know, does studies for us in NHTSA and, and, and the like. And there was similar uh, accuracy in terms of the system's ability to differentiate different types of distractions. You know, they did it as well as the trained observer. Um, but these systems can be put pretty much anywhere on roads of any speed. Um, and, you know, it's been deployed in Australia and apparently with great success. So um, that, that kind of sums up what I have. Um, I will, you know, just kind of turn things over to the next speaker and I'll look forward to uh, any Q&A that comes up after. dangerous to do this right before you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right, well, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is JT Griffin. Oh, it's supposed to be the lavalier. It's supposed to work, too. Hello, can you hear me on this? Mm -mm. Okay, we'll just go with that. Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is JT Griffin, and uh, I'm here today with Seeing Machines, um, and uh, we are a, a tier um, a tier two automotive company uh, working on driver monitoring systems. So I thought I'd start out today and just give a, a quick little overview of, of who we are as a company. Um, Seeing Machines was launched in 2000 uh, as a spin out from the Australian National University. Um, we are based in Australia, and I know we have some other friends here today from, from uh, Australia as well, so not sure what it is with the Aussies and uh, distracted driving, but uh, I'm certainly glad to be a part of, of, the, of the work that we're doing. Um, the big idea with Seeing Machines uh, was to create um, driver monitoring to, to enable the development of a crash-proof vehicle. Um, the, the vision that was originally launched in 2000 has really stood the test of time. And I'm gonna talk in just a little bit about um, uh, where we're at in terms of vehicle models and, and where the technology is. But I really wanted to take this, um, this presentation and this time to really talk about how driver monitoring works and what it is from sort of a, a more generic system. And, and, um, and we'll go from there. What's one of the things that I think is really unique about seeing machines is, um, let's see, let's cancel that. Uh, is the fact that we have invested so much in human factors work. Um, we now have over seven PhDs and a team of human factors experts really around the globe working uh, on driver monitoring. Just to level set really quickly what others have already talked about um, in terms of, of um, crash causation and what is really happening out on the roads. Um, and I think the uh, associate administrator this morning did a really nice job of, of calling what we're seeing right now what it is, which is a crisis. Um, we are now, in the, and NHTSA just released some numbers, uh, I believe last week, which shows over 40,000 deaths uh, on the road every year. Um, and when you look at what's really causing these crashes, um, you have alcohol, which is over 13,000. The new number for new official number is uh, just over 3,500 in terms of distracted driving deaths. Although I think um, it, it's really important, the new study that came out and Larry spoke about this morning uh, in terms of that estimation, which we've all known the 3,000 number was too low, um, the, the number of over 10,000 deaths every year from distracted driving. So I, I'm really um, 
you know, I think that that study is great, and I think that's one that we should all think about really using. And I was really excited to hear Nitsa use that number this morning. Um, and and I think what you'll see is it's really important for you know these three causes of of death on the roadway. And I'll talk about how driver monitoring can address those in just a second. Um, for one thing, we did take a look at uh, what what are the benefits of driver monitoring, and we found that you could save over uh, almost 40, or you could save 4,600 lives every year and prevent hundreds of thousands of injuries um, thanks to driver monitoring systems. So let's talk a little bit about what those are, how the system works. Um, so driver monitoring is a camera system, and it can be located uh, in different parts of the, of the vehicle. And here I have a couple of examples uh, and I guess I'm kind of standing in front of them, but you can see that um, it, it can go anywhere from a standalone camera, which is right here over top of the, um, oh, that's perfect, thank you. Um, it, it can be a standalone camera right behind the, uh, on the steering wheel column. Uh, it can be integrated as part of the, um, of, the, of the steering wheel so that the driver actually doesn't see that there's a camera there. Um, it could be integrated in other parts of the, of the vehicle as well, and I know uh, our friends from Magna, who is a tier one that we work with at Seeing Machines, has a demonstration vehicle um, here as well today. And it can actually be incorporated as part of the mirror. Um, and so I would highly encourage you to take a look at that system um, this afternoon. Uh, and then it can also be integrated in different places within the vehicle, the infotainment center. Um, and then you can see there it can, it can be integrated with the ADAS system. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second as well. Um, so a driver monitoring system is designed uh, to detect what the driver's doing. Where's the driver looking? Are they uh, eyes on the road? Are they looking at other parts in the vehicle cabin? Um, and then the system is designed to intervene or to create a warning if dangerous conditions are detected. Um, there's two distinct types of driver monitoring systems, and I think that's really important, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Um, there's indirect systems. Uh, where you're actually, I don't know why that keeps popping up, sorry everyone. Um, there are indirect systems, um, which are where you have, uh, it's sort of your hands on the steering wheel and the steering wheel can determine if the driver is engaged by you know, hands on the wheel. And then there's a direct system, which is what I'm gonna talk about today and what Seeing Machines makes, which is a camera-based system and it actually can monitor um, the, the driver in the cabin and um, other things in the cabin as well, but today we're primarily gonna talk about the driver. Um, so here's a, a quick video just to kind of give you a sense of what this looks like where we're actually using the cameras to, um, to detect what the driver's doing, and hopefully that'll loop. But you can see this is, uh, this is actually a really difficult situation for us to monitor because the driver has sunglasses on and you can see we can actually see through the sunglasses and here this is really the most difficult the driver's in a jeep and, and this is in australia and the the top's off and the sun is coming in behind the driver so if you think about when you take a picture with your your camera and you've got the sun behind you it'll oftentimes it'll sort of black out the face so you can't see what's happening but our system actually can it has overcome that challenge and we can actually see what the driver's doing, where they're looking, and where the, the head pose and, and gaze is. Let's see here. So in this next video, I really wanted to, again, um, talk about the complexities of how we're, we're monitoring what the driver's actually going to look at, whether the eyes are on the road or off the road. And in order to do that, we've developed, um, well, I say we, um, researchers and groups of, of folks have developed two different ways of thinking about distraction. There's the, the owl and the, there's the lizard. And so the, the owl pose is where you have um, that the head will actually move off the road. So if you're not focused, but your, your head is moving, and I'll show you that in just a second. And then the eyes are where you're actually just moving your eyes. So if somebody has a, thank you, thank you Charlie. Um, where your eyes actually move down and um, are, are you're holding a phone down like below you. So, you know, maybe it doesn't look like you're, you're looking away, but your eyes are off the road. So I'm going to give two quick videos here, just really quickly. So there you can see that's the owl where the head is actually moving down to stare at the phone. 
and then here you can see the driver is just is just making quick glances down at the phone so our system is able to detect that and then we can send that warning back to the vehicle and the vehicle can make some sort of a decision about what to do about that and now um, let's see okay so this is our latest video and this one is really cool so this is actually monitoring the whole entire cabin so um, so what we're able to do here is there's lots going on and I'm going to try and walk everyone through what you're seeing here so you can see um, the driver over here uh, eyes on the road right now and the warnings will come up over here so the driver is actually talking so we can tell that they're speaking and you can see that um, that icon will light up over there um, you can see that he's speaking and I think he's getting ready he's gonna light up a cigarette there uh, and that's actually interesting what I mean why would you track if they're smoking um, there are other in cap provisions throughout the world that are requesting that that be a feature so you can see he's yawning um, you can see we can tell that his seatbelt is on you can see that right there um, and you can tell that the driver is alert and when they're alert and when they're drowsy so that really gives you kind of a sense of what the system is seeing in the vehicle and again um, that allows uh, allows the vehicle to make certain decisions and and uh, can warn the driver if they're they don't have eyes on the road if the eyes have gone off the road for too long um, we can tell that and then uh, the driver the vehicle can react accordingly um, one thing I wanted to mention uh, and Ian was talking about this as well and I think we heard about the, this this morning is the idea of the ADAS system to prevent um, uh, distracted driving or to mitigate some of those things so you have things like um, automatic emergency braking you have lane departure warning um, uh, uh, Sophie from NHTSA this morning mentioned updating the US NCAP program so seeing machines is definitely uh, in favor of that and we've uh, we've actually commented and we believe that an ADAS system is made better and is made more robust when it's included with a driver monitoring system so if you think about it, if you have that automatic emergency braking and the car can tell whether or not the, uh, the driver is engaged, we can, we can brake sooner or we can brake later, depending on what the, what the best practice would be. Um, we, we can know if the driver is paying attention, if you're running off the lane or if you're running too close to the, um, to the, uh, um, to the line, we can know whether to make that a, a, a more sensitive system or a more, um, or more lenient system. And I think that's really important because as, as Ian mentioned, a lot of times drivers won't engage these technologies. They turn the technologies off. So if we can make the system better, if we can make the system more robust for the driver, um, we feel like it'll be, it'll be better in terms of um, uh, consumer acceptance um, and we can make a more robust overall system. So, um, you know, our thought is, is that as NHTSA is looking at updating NCAP rules, uh, DMS really is a critical component when it comes to, um, to NCAP or to um, uh, ADAS. And then finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about privacy because that's, um, I know this is a, this seems to be a very, <coughs> a very friendly room. But when you get out of this room, the first thing people will say is, I really don't want a camera watching me while I'm driving. Uh, and I certainly understand that privacy is a really big issue um, and it's a really important issue. Uh, a couple things to note about driver monitoring, although it is using a camera, it doesn't use a camera like we think of with our cell phone when we're taking a picture. Um, you saw the videos up there. We're actually looking at points. So we're looking at points on the face. We're looking at points on the eyes. We're looking at head pose. That's what we're trying to capture. We're not trying to capture, you know, other other things within the vehicle. Um, the the system uses a local processing um, computing system, which is called edge processing, which means that the technology is in the vehicle. It stays in the vehicle. It's meant to be closed loop, so it doesn't beam back up to a cloud somewhere where somebody can watch the system from afar. Um, it stays in the vehicle and is meant to be uh, an assist system for the driver. So, um, so, you know, obviously we take privacy very seriously and I know the tier ones and the OEMs do as well. So, um, you know, the point of this slide really is to sort of allay those fears about um, is, is this going to be an intrusion in my vehicle because it's not designed that way and it, it really doesn't work that way. Um, 
So that really is sort of how uh, driver monitoring systems work. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in the next panel about um, policy and, and how, to, um, how to get this technology to everybody. Um, but uh, with that, I will end on um, a thank you and thanks for inviting me today. All right, everyone, it's going to take me a minute to uh, load my presentation. But uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, I want to thank you, Steve and Jane, for sharing your stories of Mitchell and Dan. I don't usually like crying in a professional setting, but um, it's important, I think, to remind ourselves why we do what we do. So thank you for sharing. Let me. Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Michael Hernandez. I'm with the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Um, this is a trade association for those that you don't know. Uh, we represent more than 95% of the light vehicle uh, market and uh, we are represented by OEMs, uh, value chain suppliers, AV and tech companies and the like. Um, so just so you know where we're coming from and I will be talking today about the role of regulation and legislation in the technology piece. So um, I'm going to step back here a minute. Uh, distraction has been around basically as long as the car has been around. And the first car, of course, was uh, the series production car was in 1885. So you can imagine distraction has been around for quite a while. I think there's probably a little too many levers and so forth on this car to be too distracted. But as early as 1963, we saw the first um, federally funded research into distracted driving. This guy, John Senders, actually uh, had a contraption where he could flip down a visor while he's driving to figure out how much attention he needs to pay to the road. Uh, I'm assuming he didn't crash, or maybe he did, and that was how he found his limit. But uh, <laughs> you can see that this was already cropping up as, a, as an issue in 1963. And this, of course, predated cell phones, which just started uh, in 73 with kind of the uh, first portable cell phone. You're, you guys remember the big uh, brick and this is a picture of me on, on Mondays coming into the office. Uh, 2000 though is really when we started seeing the proliferation of I think distraction due to text messaging because this really brought that uh, visual manual piece together uh, and added the cognitive piece in, in composing a text message. So uh, of course we realized, the industry realized uh, this was becoming an increasing issue. Uh, so in 2006, the Alliance, uh, which was the, one of the predecessor organizations to Auto Innovators, uh, they put together with the members a, an industry-led set of distraction guidelines. Uh, this was as a, effectively as a baseline, and we looked at what is considered uh, acceptable, and that was the radio tuning task as kind of like the acceptable visual manual level of distraction. Use that as kind of the metric to determine what was uh, effectively distracting or not uh, for in-vehicle electronics. Uh, fast forward a few years, so in 2013, uh, NHTSA put out their set of distraction guidelines. Now, they had essentially three phases to this. Uh, phase one, which was the visual manual piece for in-vehicle electronics, that was released in 2013. They announced that they would be releasing kind of three phases, the second being uh, portable electronic devices brought into the vehicle. And then third uh, was going to be uh, more of a cognitive uh, audio um, interaction interface uh, and distraction guidelines around that. Uh, phase two was published as a draft and I don't think it was ever finalized and we ne never saw phase three. Uh, so that's still TBD. Uh, but let me, uh, let me shift a little bit and talk about kind of where we are today uh, in the policy landscape. So uh, you heard Steph uh, Sophie mention the um, uh, safe system approach. I think um, the, the key message that I want to bring home here is that the safe system approach is a holistic approach. Uh, so it's not just distraction, it's all vehicle safety, but when we look at any kind of safety issue, we have to look at it holistically. So of course, from my perspective, representing the auto industry, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at technologies that we can bake into the vehicle. But that's just one piece of how we countermeasure the issue of distraction at large, right? Uh, 
driver behavior, you know, educating consumers on the dangers uh, or how to drive safely, that, that could be a huge piece. Uh, infrastructure, we talked about automated enforcement, uh, enforcement in general. Uh, these things all have an influence on, on mitigating this uh, distraction. So it's not just, uh, when we're talking about technology, we're not looking just at the uh, vehicle piece here. Uh, this is old information, but I think um, tried to present it in a little bit of a, a new light here. 8.2% um, of vehicle fatalities, and of course, you know, now we know that this is a bit higher, but uh, generally speaking, um, 8.2% is fairly consistent with what we've seen historically. Uh, however, you'll notice uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, the numbers are way up. And uh, part of the explanation for this, we think, is that there's uh, driver behaviors have engaged in more risky behaviors. So drivers, and I think it was, it was mentioned in a few other presentations, uh, you know, p potentially the uh, Zoom effect, let's call it, uh, this, this new way of working, whatever the reason is, uh, even though the percentage is the same, the numbers are higher overall, so of course that percentage represents a larger portion. Uh, from the state level, and in this uh, graphic, red is more restrictive and green is less restrictive, you see we have a fairly decent number of cell phone laws uh, across the states. There's only a couple that have very liberal uh, cell phone usage. Uh, but generally speaking, the red states are uh, hands-free cell phone use only, so uh, any uh, texting or, or manipulation of the phone, uh, illegal. And these are uh, primary laws too, so you, don't, you can be uh, pulled over and ticketed uh, without any other infraction. So um, in 2021, auto innovators, uh, and, and Greg I think had an influence in this as well, um, we had our, our guidelines that were put out in, in 2006. Uh, there was a need to update these because now we have driver monitoring systems and so forth that can really start to measure a driver attention and therefore tailor the vehicle along with other vehicle sensors so that we can better understand when is uh, more attention needed, when is less attention needed, and kind of tailor the vehicle uh, to be receptive of those, of those scenarios. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, this is the legislation that is coming, well, it's already been passed, but what's coming down the pipeline uh, is a specific call out to driver monitoring systems to address, number one here, driver distraction uh, with a few other things. But uh, you can see that this is already in the minds of policymakers. Uh, so driver monitoring systems are going to be studied first and most likely regulated. Uh, we have NHTSA's budget request for next year includes uh, here $10 million for research. Uh, almost $10 million for consumer information, and there's a ton of other money going to uh, states and municipalities for other programs uh, specifically to address distraction. So this is a lot of money uh, coming down the pipeline specifically for this issue. So in summary, uh, distraction has been around forever. Uh, we have guidelines in place, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. I think now we're at a pivotal moment where we can start relying on a lot of this technology uh, to really uh, bake into the vehicle and, and into the ecosystem uh, to really attack the issue of driver distraction. The issue that I foresee from the auto industry is car companies don't want to invest a bunch of money uh, into a technology and then have policy come around and, and go in a completely different direction. So we need uh, communication, we need collaboration with our policymakers. Uh, if we can get a roadmap or a runway to say, here's what's coming down the pipeline, we can give assurance to automakers to say, this is where we're headed, get started now, and then by the time it's regulated, it's not even going to be an issue. Uh, so as I said, uh, a lot more work is, uh, is needed. And uh, lastly, the, um, you know, the technology is going to allow us a little more flexibility, but also more effective uh, driver distraction uh, countermeasure. So with that. I will turn it over to Greg. Thank you. Check, check. Can you all hear me? All right. Give me a minute while I switch computers too. Okay, is that coming up? We good? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Greg Fitch. Uh, and as Charlie mentioned earlier, I lead safety research for Android Auto at Google. 
And I'm incredibly thankful for the opportunity to share how we design our driving products and features for use while driving and to mitigate driver distraction. So we have a vision to create a safe and seamless connected experience in every car, in every car. And we have a series of, or a suite of products and features that we design um, for drivers. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about them. So the first is do not disturb driving mode. As you heard earlier, do not disturb driving mode blocks incoming calls, texts, and other notifications when driving is detected. Drivers can set up do not disturb driving mode to automatically activate when driving is detected through a Bluetooth uh, connection established with the car or as if determined, uh, if, if approved, uh, using GPS um, vehicle motion from the phone. <clears throat> do not disturb when activated still allows emergency calls to be placed to 911 as well as communications with important contacts to be received if the driver sets that up ahead of time. I want to point out that do not disturb driving mode activating at least uh, remains under the driver's control, their decision. And this is because of the contextual nature of driving as well as the other products that we offer drivers uh, to mitigate distraction. The next is another feature for the phone and I'm gonna make the point that the average user of the car on the road in the United States at least is 12 years old and a lot of people just in, in the States and around the world do not have access to vehicles with the latest and greatest safety technology. And the phone is the only way that they can communicate, connect, navigate the world. And as um, Jen noted earlier, is just how they connect. And they need to connect after you know, going through this pandemic. Uh, it's just become ingrained in their life. So we know from our research that the most common things that people do while driving are navigating, listening to media, and communications. And so we put a lot of thought into how can you create an interface that allows drivers to do this without having to fiddle with their phone. So you put the phone in a cradle and you have this driving experience, assistant driving experience presented where maps are on top, the media controls are at the bottom, and you can use the OK uh, G is what we say, so we don't activate all your phones, but a uh, hot word to use your voice to uh, communicate with the phone, control the phone, communicate, um, or have messages automatically read out if you receive them. Okay, so those are for that's what we do for phones. And then we have Android Auto, uh, which is our equivalent of CarPlay, if you've heard of CarPlay. Uh, but basically we take what otherwise would be on the phone and project it on the car's display. So the car display is bigger, it's higher up, and the benefits of Android Auto is you see bigger fonts, you have bigger tap targets, and you get to see parts of the road with peripheral vision. Again, we take the same approach, we put your maps and media control side by side so you don't have to fiddle with the interface to, to find maps. And again, you can use your voice like we did with your phone to control the um, parts of the interface as well as uh, communicate. And finally, maybe, uh, uh, sorry, Steve mentioned this earlier, so thank you for the plug, but we are partnering with uh, major, major car companies to build Google into the car. So your maps are in the center, cons uh, center stack display, you have the Google Assistant, and this is providing deeper connections with electric vehicles to know like, how your routing should uh, be changed based on your charge level of your car, uh, as well as how the Google Assistant can help make better use of your vehicle efficiently, uh, but also more safely. So we think deeply about safety, and I, I'm, I wanna make that point, that's one of the most important points I wanna to make today. So we think deeply about safety, and we have a set of safety principles that we've developed by looking at distraction guidelines from government and industry, as well as international standards um, on you know, even aviation. But uh, they can be, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but they can be summarized in four buckets uh, that I'd like to talk about. So the first is to keep things simple, right? An interface uh, that we use, so our users, our drivers, uh, you know, they're driving first and foremost. It's different than using a phone um, at the office or watching TV at home. Uh, there's a primary task that is not our product. And so a simple interface that's easy to see, easy to touch, keeps tasks short, is gonna reduce the demands and have less distraction. The next is to let drivers use their voice. So this comes out of the research that Virginia Tech and others have done, but voice interaction allows you to keep your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel, which is, and it is a far lesser uh, risk, uh, crash risk than other forms of visual manual distraction. Having the Google Assistant activated with your voice or with the touch of a steering wheel button really helps here. So drivers don't need to use their phone to, to activate controls. The third principle is to anticipate driver's needs. 
We know that excessive browsing, the research shows it, leads to uh, you know, driver distraction. But not only that, just fumbling through the interfaces takes a lot of effort. No one really wants to be doing that, period. So drivers in particular are very much creatures of habit. And we can anticipate what they would otherwise be looking for doing on their phone and surface that to the top of the interface so they don't have to browse to find it. Um, and uh, yeah, we think a lot about how the Google Assistant can help us anticipate drivers' needs. And our final principle is support attention to the road. Now, this one came out of applying the first three principles to the design and, de and release of Android Auto. But you know, we, we saw that if you put restrictions in the Android Auto interface, that can lead drivers to using their phone. If you don't put browsing restrictions in the interface, that can lead to excessive levels of distraction. And this is important because when you look away from the road, you reduce or degrade your situation awareness. And we've been working with uh, MIT and Virginia Tech to understand attention threading, but we know that if you look, if you take long glances back to the road, you rebuild the situation awareness. And this is like an awareness of what's around you, how those objects are moving, and whether those objects are gonna collide. So based on this theory of attention threading, Android Auto now temporarily restricts browsing if we see that you're doing too many taps over a window of time. And we know from our research that these, these browsing restrictions lead drivers to look back at the road. And from other research we've done, we know that this is important for hazard awareness and good vehicle control uh, in emergencies. So those are our safety principles, but it doesn't end there. We evolve our understanding of safety through research. And this slide shows all the methods that we're doing right now. Um, some of them will be familiar to you all, but you know, we can look at the visual demands of a simple feature using occlusion goggles or driving simulator. We can evaluate the cognitive demands, cognitive demands of a feature using detection response task equipment. Uh, we can look at driver control, vehicle, and avoidance uh, outcomes using test track research at Virginia Tech, for instance. Um, or do accompanied on-road studies, uh, looking at where drivers look when they use our products, as well as observational naturalistic studies to see how people use their products in the real world when they're not accompanied by an experimenter. And all these forms of research tell a story. They tell us how to make our products better so that we can reduce distraction, but it's also really worth the investment because we learn about drivers' unique needs and how our products can better meet those needs. Okay, so to wrap up, my, my talk, I put a few slides together on how all the technologies heard today could work together. Um, and I want to start by saying that context matters. You've seen from the research that the crash risk of distractions depends on where you're driving, who's driving, and what you're driving, and what safety systems that vehicle might have. Context matters. And if context is so important, it makes sense that the safety systems in our car understand driving context, right? And we think there's an opportunity for that as it's been shown today. Collision avoidance systems have outward facing sensors and they can capture and estimate the driving task demands. How hard is it to drive in this moment? You've got driver monitoring systems, both direct and indirect, that can estimate how attentive is the driver? How much are they looking at this road? And so you take those two together and you put it into a system in the car that assesses are drivers paying enough attention for this current moment? If system were to do that, we call that a driver attention support system. So are drivers paying enough attention in the moment? And actually, you know, I've been teed up for this, but it's already, it already being actively discussed and thought about, but if a system could determine that a driver is not paying enough attention in the moment, you have a lot of, uh, tasks or activity or a lot of uh, countermeasures at your control. You can suppress notifications, you can present attention prompts that some of the systems do today to get you to look back at the road. You could present collision avoidance system alerts earlier, like a lane departure warning alert could come on earlier, um, which not only improves effectiveness, can also improve the, <laughs> the perceived helpfulness of the system. Or you could do what we're doing, which is temporarily, brow temporarily restrict browsing. But the concept is new and still requires uh, development in terms of research, in terms of technology development, systems that actually do these connections together uh, still need to be improved and worked on. And we need policy to work in concert with us so we know that <coughs> it's worth the investment in this, in this effort. 
Um, but we are working, Google is working with MIT and a handful of other car companies on building a framework for how driver attention support could work. This is through the MIT AHEAD consortium. And uh, yeah, we're, we're really hopeful. And again, auto innovators, thank you for plugging it, but like, uh, we're, we're getting it um, more and more uh, recognized and discussed, which is important at this point. So to finish, um, you know, we have a set of safety principles that we design our auto products to and we test to them. And uh, we, you know, we, we do think that, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, we have a set of safety principles that we design and test to and uh, we, we value safety deeply when we think about and work towards building our auto products. And then finally, driver attention support systems present this real great opportunity that we're hopeful about. Uh, not only for improving safety, but even by bringing in context into the car, can create more immersive experiences that drivers find to be helpful. So thank you very much for your time. I'm going to take this slide, actually. Okay. okay, so I um, am going to go ahead and moderate this session. And um, as the moderator, I'm going to kick off the questions um, and ask a few of my own. Um, so for all of the speakers here, I'm, I think there's, there's a couple different lines of really important questions. And, and so for, all, for, those, for the technologies that you discussed, one of the first things I'd like to ask you about is, all of you mentioned um, that people aren't using, right? drivers are not using some of these technologies that are currently available today. Can you, can you talk about how we can improve use of these technologies that are available today? And Ian, I'd like you to start. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think there are a lot of, a lot of opportunities to increase the use of the, the technologies we're talking about. You know, the strategies are, are I think, will vary uh, by, the, by the technology, but, you know, lane departure warning is, is one of the systems that, you know, I've done a lot of work studying. Um, you know, people, half the people turn these systems off. Um, they find, when we ask them why, they say it's either uh, they don't see the system as useful or they find the warnings annoying. And so, um, you know, there's, there could be education efforts that could uh, really emphasize the usefulness of the technology. Um, we did do a, a, a small study um, uh, about a year ago that identified a really big knowledge gap between people who buy uh, vehicles with these technologies used versus people who buy them new off the lot. People who buy these uh, cars with these systems used are much less aware of the technology. They are unable to explain how they work. And um, so that's, that's a population that you know, we, we should really get ahead of because more and more people are going to have their first exposure to ADAS technology from a used vehicle. Um, Another option to increasing use of these, these systems that people find annoying or are not useful is to consider how they're implemented. Most automakers design the lane departure warning systems to, uh, you know, if a driver decides to turn it off, they maintain that off status until the driver decides to turn it back on. But there are a couple of companies, uh, Subaru and Nissan Infinity, who uh, have the system default to on at the ignition cycle. And you know, I've not done enough research into looking at driver acceptance of, of that um, implementation, but that would be a way to increase use uh, with, without um, you know, doing some of the things that JT and Greg were talking about, which is to integrate the, you know, the driver monitoring system that can really you know, tweak sensitivity on the fly based on whether the driver's paying attention or not. And that's, that is a great option, but I, you know, I think uh, that's being able to do that um, is you know, a little bit down the road, whereas an automaker could decide to, you know, I'm gonna have the system default to on pretty, yeah. pretty quickly. Okay. Any other comments? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to um, 
talk a little bit more about the vehicle perspective. Uh, as Ian mentioned, you know, a lot of these systems have benefits far down the road, especially in the used vehicle market. But on the front end, it does, it, you know, those used vehicles won't help you if they don't have the equipment. So it's incentivizing the deployment of that equipment at the early stages when the vehicle's sold new. Uh, how do you do that? I think one of the big uh, elements that we, as the auto industry, push for is uh, NCAP or other incentive programs. I think uh, IIHS even has um, uh, an influence here as well. If you can incentivize manufacturers to equip these systems, even if it's not uh, you know, highly desired by the customer, uh, it's, it's still driving that deployment. There's other options as well. You know, if uh, insurance companies offer discounts or whatever for certain equipment, uh, that can also incentivize customers to, to purchase this equipment. Um, I think from the, uh, from the vehicle perspective as well, um, you know, as we um, get into these older vehicles, uh, having these uh, systems in place, you know, there's a, a bit of an adaptation, I think, that, that goes along with both the customer and the car company. Um, I, I used to work for BMW. I, I remember when they first came out with their uh, lane keeping assist system, it was so aggressive because it was built to the Euro, uh, Euro NCAP standard, I believe, which was a lot more aggressive than I think uh, US customers were expecting. And it resulted in a, a lot of complaints, people turning the system off. So now when you get into a BMW, uh, not only is the system at a, a default level much less intrusive, but there's a, it's also adjustable. If you go into the infotainment, you can adjust the aggressivity of the lane keeping. So I think systems like that, uh, that can tailor to the customer's wants and needs uh, would also help uh, you know, these systems long, long down the road. Great, Thanks. Chuck, okay. Yeah, so thank you for the great question, and I put all some thoughts together. So to increase usage of Android Auto, I think it starts with educating users that the system is available. Um, frankly, there's a lot, not everyone knows that the system is available on their car or on their phone. So that's, a, that's the first thing. The second thing would be to educate users that the system is helpful on short and familiar trips. Some people might think, well, I only need, I'm not going on a very far trip. It's kind of the same mentality with maybe partial seatbelt usage, but I'm not going very far, so I don't need to connect the phone. Um, but getting them to use the technology on short and familiar trips would also go a long way since those are more common. Um, we can do a lot to educate drivers that there is a safer way. Um, but I think also, like I mentioned, just figuring out best ways to be helpful in the context uh, that there's various different contexts for driving uh, will go a long way. Um, for Google built-in, I think one of the ways to increase adoption there is just to make it available in all tiers of cars. Um, right now it's coming out in the newer cars that are towards the higher end, uh, but it's uh, it's something that we're companies, car, we're, our partners, our auto partners, are working to um, help bring to all tiers of cars. And then regarding do not disturb, I think there's um, a lot we could do, as Ian's pointed out, to research what are the barriers to usage. Uh, we can, one, once we understand those barriers, figure out messaging around how to address those barriers, uh, and then send messaging, um, communicate with the people on how the do not disturb driving mode in, in a way that they need to hear. Uh, can help them. And uh, yeah, just let them know that this is a safer way for them to connect. So. Okay, great. I will open the floor up for questions. Anyone have any questions for this panel? I'll start with a virtual question. This is from Francesco Biondi. Um, it's challenging to find reliable real-world data on the accuracy of DMS. You presented some data on the intended benefits of these systems, but I am curious if you have any data showing the accuracy of these systems in preventing mitigating driver distraction in the real world, perhaps comparing the prevalence of driver distraction in vehicles versus without DMS. Thanks. Can you hear me? There you go. That's a, that's a really good question. I think um, it is challenging to get the data, and part of the challenge is, is that uh, the systems are just now rolling out. And as we've talked about with uh, the research, and especially with the first panel, um, you find that until you kind of get that naturalistic study, which are expensive to do, which are very time consuming, 
um, it is hard to it is hard to get the data. I know I've talked to my friends from the Insurance Institute, and I'm going to talk a little bit about level two driving systems versus and, and how driver monitoring works with that. Um, but I've talked to my friends at the Insurance Institute about you know trying to study it, and you know the challenge is is that we don't have those cars here yet in the U.S. that are that are sort of pure DMS. Um, so uh, uh, in terms of purely detecting distraction, they, the the systems tend to go along with another vehicle. So I think you're going to see more of that data. I think you're going to see it coming out soon. Um, and, uh, and I would say stay tuned for that. Driver monitoring system. I would also argue that there's, there's probably quite a bit of data, but it's all proprietary. And again, it, it probably will be coming out. And there will be more and more studies coming. Um, I, you know, Sophie Schulman talked about that NHTSA has several DMS studies ongoing right now, and so I think we will be seeing more and more in the coming years, but um, right now there's no question it's, um, it's more difficult to identify. First, let me just say outstanding presentations from all of you. Fantastic. I'm, I'm so pleased that uh, we have all of you here. Thank you for that. On a follow-up on the DMS, what can we learn from what uh, Europe's doing with the implementation and the regulation of DMS in 2025 or 2026? question, Steve, and, uh, and so I'm definitely going to talk about that in the next panel, but I'll, I'll go ahead and I don't think it hurts to say it twice. So um, I don't think that's working. Oh. Anyway, um, so uh, I would say what we can learn from Europe is, you know, Europe and, and the European NCAP program are really looking at driver monitoring systems as a safety system. It is a uh, it is a uh, technology that can detect whether or not the driver is distracted, whether they're drowsy. We think in the near future if they're impaired. Um, whereas the United States, the, the rollout has been more with level two driving systems. So if you think about a system like uh, General Motors Super Cruise, um, that's a system that's using driver monitoring to let the driver go hands off the wheel. Uh, and so it's a different, it's kind of a different function. So I think it's really important that as, um, as NHTSA is, is looking at updating NCAP, they're looking at um, distracted driving and uh, you know, future rulemakings to keep in mind that you know, driver monitoring can absolutely serve as, a, as a, almost a pure safety system and it can really help with ADAS as well. So. Sorry, I just want to tag on to that. Um, I feel it's my duty as the uh, representative of the industry to uh, really push for international harmonization. So of mm -hmm. course, uh, manufacturers love harmonizing uh, internationally. It makes their job easier and, and saves money, of course. But um, to, to reiterate that uh, point that JT made, uh, you know, when we, I, I mentioned that policy is a good driver for technology, and we have to be careful uh, when we push these policies that we understand where we're pushing, right? Uh, these DMS systems can, can operate as a pure safety system, as a partial safety system, or as a non-safety system. I mean, uh, just in the IIJA legislation alone, uh, driver distraction was number one. That's, of course, safety related. Driver complacent, or automation complacency, I think, was on there. Uh, you know, that is the convenience feature, but if it can become a safety issue, uh, and then, you know, how you respond, how the DMS uh, promotes the vehicle to respond to each of these can be vastly different as well. Uh, if you're distracted, an alert would, can potentially bring you back into the loop. Uh, if you're impaired, a, an alert's not really going to do anything for you. So uh, the policy really has to distinguish uh, what exactly it's trying to tackle and, you know, safety systems I think should take, uh, of course, the priority there. Yes. Um, so, unfortunately, we joined the ranks with Steve and Jane in their loss um, when we lost our son in 2019 to an unlicensed reckless driver um, at 16 years old. And so what we found through this process was legislation, right? Things that had not been done in our state that were common sense. Um, the dangers of distracted driving and speeding were not in our driver education classes. Um, finding that 
state by state by state. And since you have to mandate this by state and not by federal, my question is, with this technology, which is all wonderful for us as adults, teenagers already are the, the number one cause of death is, is driving, right? They already don't do driver education classes like they should. They think it's a joke, it's a free period, it's an easy A. So how are we going to mandate, probably through legislation, the help that the teenagers are going to need to be able to use these technologies in cars? A, because they're probably not gonna have that car. They're gonna have a, an older car, they're gonna have their mom and dad's car, but they're gonna want that new car. But how are we going to protect our teenagers because bad teenage drivers who make it through their teenage years become bad adult drivers. So how do we educate our teenagers and that very young group on what we need them to know, which they're already not learning, um, in my opinion? Excellent question. Panelists? Uh, I'll take a stab first. Um, there is a huge number of responses that could be given to that question, but uh, I will say, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, teen drivers have, have it the most difficult. And I think uh, the easiest way to facilitate safe teen driving is to eliminate as much distraction or the possibility of distraction to begin with. Uh, one uh, technology that I would like to highlight is uh, Ford's MyKey. It's a, a system, it's basically a key that you give to your teen driver that modifies the vehicle. So it, it by default turns all the safety systems on. Uh, it, it shuts off uh, so receiving cell phones and text messages. Uh, it does a number of things to really uh, focus the teen driver on driving and nothing else. And so I think uh, there's a, a great opportunity there uh, from the technology side to influence uh, that that's already in the market. It doesn't need to be legislated. So parents, I encourage you to go out there and seek these types of technologies out. Uh, but from a le legislative perspective, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, there is so much that can be done. And I think we, uh, we really need to um, you know, work, as I mentioned, collaboratively with uh, agencies, regulatory bodies, with the car companies and so forth. Uh, so we can really, you know, together reach that, that end goal. Michael, that was a great uh, advertisement, advertorial, whatever, for why we are here, the National Distracted Driving Coalition, because collectively we've got a tremendous amount of knowledge within this group and we have expertise in various areas. So on your side, you know, you have a particular area of interest and capability, whereas in some other areas, um, we will have that and, and collectively we can all deal with that. So I have a question about, it was mentioned uh, about older cars. I speak with authority on the topic, don't let it get around, but uh, anyway, uh, what about retrofit of some of the technologies into older vehicles? Now I know that the car manufacturers want to sell new cars, but we were talking, I believe it was uh, Ian, you said there's a 30-year turnover uh, lifespan, so I'd really like to hear uh, a bit about uh, can we do some retrofit, and I know there was something mentioned earlier about a uh, capability there, and then I have a follow-up question. Oh, yeah, yes. Good question, and the short answer is yes. Uh, there are a lot of uh, options for retrofitting cars with aftermarket crash avoidance technology. Um, the Mobileye produces a device um, that we evaluated uh, five, six years ago with a small sample of IHS employees. It, the, the device has a forward collision warning, lane departure warning, a speed limit warning, a, a headway monitoring that tells you how, uh, how many seconds or between you and the car ahead of you. Um, and then it had a, a, a low speed sort of uh, city collision warning for you know, stop and go traffic. And um, we, we measured driver's behavior change with telematics devices. They worked well. The, the forward collision warning and the lane departure warning passed uh, NHTSA's NCAP test for forward collision warning and, and LDW. 
uh, so they would work as well as most of the rudimentary systems. Great. So where can I get one and how much does it cost? <laughs> and what kind of communication do we have? This is a challenge for all of us to get the word out. So that's, that's one question which you may not be able to answer right away, but please give that yeah. some thought. So at the time, they were working with uh, retail centers like Best Buy, um, and you could have a unit installed for about a grand. Okay. All right. Um, so, but there are other options out there, and I, I believe there are even, um, and I, we haven't tested them, but there are applications you can download on your smartphone and, and, and use for a rudimentary forward collision warning as well. Okay, so now this is a softball question for you, but uh, for the insurance community, it seems like we should have a double-pronged approach, carrot and stick, to encourage people we tend to focus on punishment sometimes, but uh, if you can give them an incentive, and economics is a driver of everything, if we can give them some kind of an incentive to start to equip with these technologies and, and uh, modify behavior, uh, I think you would start to see an awful lot of uh, improvement out there. So uh, thank you very much. We do have a question back here. This is somewhat directed to um, Dr. Fitch. Uh, you were the first one today to bring up and use the phrase education, so thank you for that. Because driver education is incredibly important. It answers a lot of the other questions that people have raised this morning, but you were the first to broach it. So um, on that vein, uh, you, are, you mentioned that Google works with MIT and other very smart uh, folks at organizations, which kind of puts it on in what, what you're doing as an outside in, right? So are you working with the state DMVs um, who are doing their own things? And I think you spoke at the Virginia Distracted Driving Conference that I attended, and one of the speakers on uh, autonomous vehicles was doing something, and then the director of the Virginia Department of Motor Vehicle um, gave a presentation about how for Virginia, they're uh, changing the miles per hour based on, do you remember that conversation? Based on traffic. So when it gets really congested, their highway goes from 65 to 55. And then the person who was talking about all the innovation in autonomous driving um, was concerned because how would a vehicle set to drive at 65 know that now all of a sudden on the highway it's 55. So the point is, I think not just from the overarching smart folks of the world at MIT, but really you have to include the people that this applies to because they're all doing things that are a little different and on their own and unless they can both talk to one another, you're not really solving as many problems as maybe you could. So mm -hmm. are you including the state departments of motor vehicle in some of the things that you're doing? Uh, thanks for the question. So I, maybe Jen can help me, but we're, we're members, we're stakeholders of the National Driver Distraction Coalition. We meet every month, our subcommittees meet more regularly, and we get to hear a lot of input, a lot of diverse input on how to solve, how to find solutions for driver distraction. <laughs> looking for the audience. But I, I, are anyone from the DMV represented in the NDDC? I, uh, I'm, so. Right. But the point I think is just how do you get diverse input? And uh, so, you know, like I said, we thought deeply about it and we said it was worth spending our time to be contributing and listen, take information back. I think, you know, we were brought in to provide the technology perspective, but we are also coming back with everyone else's perspective and building products around that. So, uh, but the, the, you're asking about the DMV, and I, you know, I could go back and find out. Uh, we've got other people at the company that engage with government, and uh, I can ask that question. So, but yeah, just, I think your more general question is we take diverse input. Okay, one more question, because I'd like to make sure that we have time for the other panel. And I just want to chime in one more thing about that. That is why we're bringing on others as stakeholders to join us. We want to grow the coalition to get more people involved in those subcommittees so we can know that needs to be connected between that and trickle down. It's, 
about the dissemination of it. And so if everyone can start attending our stakeholder meetings, you know, getting involved in the subcommittees, the next one will be May 5th. So if you send us an email at info at USND, usnddc.org, we can make sure and get you the information to get on that call and get involved. Okay, one more question. Hi, good morning everybody. Uh, Steven's off here from uh, the USDOT. I uh, wanted to thank everybody here, especially those who've suffered personal loss for sharing their experiences and their, and their expertise. I have a question also for Greg uh, regarding uh, mobile phones. Uh, one of the reasons that mobile phones have become so powerful as tools in our daily lives is because of the third party development, all the additional apps that you can add that Google hasn't been the, you know, the initial author of. So I wanted to understand uh, within the ecosystem of Android Auto or Android Automotive, um, how are you informing, educating, managing the development of those apps with respect to in-vehicle distraction? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Steve. There's a simple answer, and it's templates. So we basically create the sandbox size for people to play in. And we put a lot of thought into how big that sandbox should be. And so you, know, you saw the surf pr first principle was to keep tasks short or keep things simple. That includes keeping tasks short and fonts big and tap targets large. We get to define those for the third parties. And honestly, the third party app developers, this is a nuanced, complex topic. <laughs> and it's, you know, people up here have been studying it for decades. And it's still very hard. Uh, so it's not, no, no third party developer has those resources at their disposal to go and investigate how to build an app for driving. So we take it on us, we build the contact, the, the app templates um, so that uh, the apps developers can focus on their experience that uh, is driving relevant, gonna meet a driver need, uh, but it's not gonna create over uh, unacceptable levels of distraction. So. That's great. This has been an excellent panel. I want to thank all of the speakers, and I think they deserve another round of applause. We will take a very five, 10 minute break. Just a transition five minute break, and the next panel will get started. Thank you so much for your attention and your fabulous questions. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so we're gonna get started with our final panel of the day. Uh, which is on preventing distraction using real-time data uh, on drivers. Um, I'm going to go ahead, uh, GT, and ask you to come up because you're going to start us off. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm back. So thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for bearing with me here. Um, and no videos in this presentation, so hopefully, uh, although they did work pretty well in the last one, so here we go. Um, so I, I appreciate you uh, letting me speak. Uh, it's supposed to, is it on? Uh, I, don't, I don't think we hear you. Is this my time? You know, is that better? Yeah. Can you That's hear that? Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I appreciate you giving me another opportunity to talk about policy when it uh, comes to distracted driving and driver monitoring systems because I think there really is an opportunity um, to, to really do some good work and to save a lot of lives using uh, driver monitoring. So I really want to talk about that right now. Um, just, a couple, just a quick update on the fatalities. I think we talked earlier about the, uh, the number that NHTSA introduced or, or announced last week, 42,795. 42, that really is a national crisis. And I think that's the reason that we're all here today. Um, as, uh, as Mike mentioned, and, and we've talked about a little bit, um, the Department of Transportation and the NTSB, and I, and I really do give uh, Member Hamandi a lot of credit for really pushing um, the safe systems approach. Uh, it's an approach that uh, many globally have used um, for years now, and it really has become uh, the, the marching orders for the DOT to the safety community and to really to everyone in terms of how we're gonna solve this problem of, of traffic deaths. Um, uh, in terms of driver monitoring, there really are two, um, two pieces of the, of the safe systems approach where driver monitoring is applicable. You've got safer people and you've got safer vehicles, and that really is where driver monitoring comes into play. Um, I mentioned before what and how Seeing Machines works and, and what our company does. Um, I think this is really important to note that um, we talked last, last uh, panel about our, our partnerships with OEMs and how we're trying to, uh, to, to work in, in those systems. 
Um, but driver monitoring also works for aviation related um, uh, systems. We have an aviation unit within seeing machines that is, um, is working with uh, OEMs in the aviation space. Um, but I really wanted to point out that we also have an aftermarket business and that's the Guardian system. And so Guardian is a, a primarily used in fleet vehicles. It's used in, um, in trucks. Uh, and it is exactly what you would think it is. It's a, it's a camera that sits on the dash and it watches the driver to make sure that they're not sleepy or that they're not distracted. Um, and it, the system has really rolled out in Australia. Um, it, it's used quite heavily there and in other parts of the world. And I'm really excited it is, uh, it is going to be rolling out in a much bigger way here in the United States um, later this year, I believe in Q3. Um, and why is all of that important? Well, because we talked about and people have asked me the question, well, when is this system going to be available? When is driver monitoring um, something that can actually go into the cars? And I would, would say to you that it is ready right now. Um, in terms of where we're at for, from a seeing machines perspective, um, we have been over 7 billion miles. Um, we, are, uh, we are working with over 10 different OEMs um, and we are in 15 different automotive programs. So as you can see from the numbers up on the screen here, um, over uh, 15 million distraction events that we've detected. Um, and then over the last uh, 12 months, the Guardian system has picked up over a quarter million um, fatigue events. And so those are, those are, are strictly on our uh, aftermarket system. Um, Steve asked the question before, what's the difference between the United States and what other countries and other regions are doing? Um, it, it really is a difference between, in, in Europe, the, the European NCAP um, program has really looked at this system as a, uh, a safety system. And so they are looking at requiring driver monitoring um, it's already part of their Euro NCAP program beginning this year. So in order for cars to get a five-star safety rating in Europe, they have to have a driver monitoring system that's going to uh, detect distraction and fatigue. And then um, in another, I believe it's another two years, 2025, uh, they have to have driver monitoring to um, detect impairment as well. So that is something as a company I can tell you we're working really hard on and trying to figure out its uh, there are other layers to impairment that make it, um, make it difficult for different reasons. Um, but here in the U.S., where you would find a driver monitoring system is with a level two driver assist system. So we mentioned um, in the last um, Q&A, I mentioned the Super Cruise system. Uh, it's also part of the Blue Cruise system, uh, which is Ford's version of the same system. It's a, it's a hands-free driving um, driving um, assist system where you can, the driver can take their hands off the wheel, but their eyes have to be on the road. Um, and if the driver's not engaged, then the car will tell the driver, hey, you've got you know, to pay attention or else the system gets cut off. And the, the system is only available uh, on certain roads that have been mapped. So the car will actually pull itself over if you're not engaged when the car tells you to. Um, from that perspective, uh, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and Consumer Reports have put recommendations out that recommend um, in order to have their highest safety rating, you have to have a direct driver monitoring system as part of one of those systems. So for example, that would be like a seeing machine system that's using a camera watching the driver. So I think when you look at what's driving driver monitoring, um, no pun intended there, uh, you're really looking at these two different approaches. Um, and as Mike mentioned in the last panel, there's no reason that they can't come together to create a really great, robust safety system here in the United States. Uh, in terms of what's happening in, in Europe, again, um, Europe really started looking at driver monitoring well before level two automation sort of became popular or a thing. Um, the NCAP program started requiring driver monitoring this year. And so, you know, as a result, obviously, companies that make uh, driver monitoring systems have seen a huge uh, interest from OEMs. We've seen lots of awards going out. Um, as I mentioned in the, in the previous slide, we're at 10 OEMs uh, we've, we're, we're working with. 
uh, and over 15 uh, vehicle programs, and that number keeps growing literally by the day. Um, in terms of regulations in Europe, so I mentioned the NCAP program and Euro NCAP, but Europe will actually regulate driver monitoring starting July 1st, 2024. So this, you know, not only will you have a recommendation for a safety system, but you will have a requirement that these systems be in new vehicles. Um, and uh, as part of their long-term roadmap, DMS is to be considered for impaired driving. So again, that is something that as the system um, evolves, uh, it's something that um, you can definitely keep an eye on. Um, one of the things that I think is uh, important and is challenging with, with these systems is the performance standards and the measures and how does it work, what does it do, uh, and fortunately, the Euro NCAP program put together a paper, and there's, it's up here. There's a, um, there's a link to it as well in the, um, in the presentation that you're welcome to, to get uh, that really lays down what the, the framework for standards should look like. So these things, is, you know, as we talked about, Europe tends to be very aggressive, progressive, however you want to look at it, and pushing these types of safety systems, but the framework is there for, um, for, for sort of whether it's regulatory, whether it's through NCAP or some other type of a system. Um, and they meet regular, regularly. Um, there was just a workshop in Spain back in October that Seeing Machines was part of as part of that tier two group making recommendations um, to Europe. So, so where does that leave us here in the United States? So Europe's doing all these great things. Um, they're pushing these, these systems as a safety system. Um, where we are in, in the U.S. is, as part of the Infrastructure Act, uh, the bipartisan, you know, it's called many things. The, I always call it the highway bill because I've been working on highway bills for a long time. Um, but there were really three different um, provisions that were included as part of that that I really believe are um, important for driver monitoring and distracted driving. Um, the first thing is an update to the NCAP program. So um, Seeing Machines has been you know, working, commenting with NHTSA to make sure that you know, our thoughts on, on including driver monitoring as part of NCAP are, um, are part of that and uh, what it will eventually be a rulemaking um, and recommendations on updating that, that NCAP program. I think that's really important. Um, it really is a good way, um, as we talked about again, to, um, to encourage the industry to, um, to adopt some of these, these features. There was also a distracted driving um, requirement as, as part of the infrastructure law. And it allows and requires NHTSA to study DMS for three years, and then if a rulemaking is necessary, to begin that process. So um, right now, NHTSA is really looking at uh, how does DMS work? What does it do? What are the uses? They're really doing a comprehensive uh, review of the systems and how they work. And so, um, you know, hopefully that will, will show the value of the systems and um, will, will lead to um, more driver monitoring adoption in the future. And then finally, there's a rulemaking in the infrastructure law specific to, um, to alcohol detection and impairment detection. And at Seeing Machines, we think that the system eventually will evolve to where we can detect impairment. Um, many of you know I was at MAD for years and years and worked on this program. Um, what's, what's really exciting to me about driver monitoring is um, the potential for, for stopping drunk driving in the future. Um, you know, it will look a little different than, than some of the different systems that we've thought of in the past. Um, driver monitoring wouldn't measure BAC limits. It would be able to, you know, perhaps take a um, take a snapshot of, um, you know, if somebody's eyes are off the road for a certain period of time. Um, you know, with drunk driving, you have different ways of measuring impairment, not just through BAC, things like horizontal gaze and nystagmus and things like that. Um, driver monitoring could certainly be a solution for that in the future as well. So that's something that I think down the road um, the system could evolve to. And one of the great things with new vehicles is the ability to uh, push out updates over the air to those vehicles. And so if you have the camera and the sensor in the vehicle for driver monitoring now, that gives you the opportunity in the future. We've talked about the challenge of fleets rolling over and if you don't have the vehicle in there or the, the, the technology in there now, what's gonna happen in the future? So I think as these systems get better and better, 
um, the ability to update over the air will really be a benefit with these with these driver monitoring uh, and DMS systems now. Um, so with that, um, those are our thoughts on policy and, and really where this can go, and we'll uh, we'll look forward to questions at the end. Thanks, JT. So I'm going to introduce uh, Ryan McCann, McMahon, sorry, as I set up this presentation, who's the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Corporate Development at Cambridge Mobile Telematics. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. So I'm going to give a little bit of a background, and thank you, by the way. This has been eye-opening, uh, truly eye-opening. So thank you, Jennifer, for all your efforts in getting this activity front of mind for so many people. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of background about who we are so you get a sense of what the data is that I'm going to talk about later. The data is um, very impactful, but if you don't have a good understanding of where it came from, you might you know, not really get the sense of scale. So just a little bit of background, Cambridge Mobile Telematics is a technology company that was founded out of MIT, research at MIT. And it was founded by two professors, Har Balakrishnan and Sam Madden that were doing work on mobile sensing. It was actually before smartphones, and their work was initially on road surface conditions. And they were analyzing the ability to look at various sensors and determine from uh, those sensors installed in cabs at the time where the potholes were. And that first product was called Pothole Patrol. And they published on this, and then all of a sudden the insurance industry started to take notice. And the insurance industry started to take notice because at the same time, they were investing in technology that could measure driving behavior so that they could set prices based on it. So the insurance industry is, you know, I just came from an event on auto insurance right before I was here. And it is two sides of the same coin. I feel very privileged to see both sides because the auto insurance industry is an economic force of trying to determine safety elements that lead to their ability to know how much premium to collect and then to make sure that they've collected enough premium to pay losses. But it's not by themselves, so they have competitors at the same time, which is great for the system because now it encourages them to continue to research and determine what elements are going to lead to loss and which ones will not. And as a result of that, they get the opportunity to then continually invest in data that clearly articulates the difference between somebody getting into a crash or not. But it wasn't until they actually knew the data from an individual driver that they could actually start to do this on an individual basis. All the technology before that, or all the data that was used before that was aggregate. It's all aggregated data, traffic stops, looking at um, crashes, looking at um, financial elements, geographic, and all these data elements were being used to help to understand where losses were happening and where they weren't. But then all of a sudden they started to realize that they could take an OBD device, put it into, inside the car, and then from that OBD device they could determine hard braking. And that was kind of the first element. But those things are pretty expensive, and you have to mail them out to individuals. This is before you know, this giant you know, wireless world we live in now. So the first implementation of the technology was, and this wasn't CMTs, was plugging in, wireless, was plugging in OBD devices into a car. And uh, then you'd send it back to the insurance company, and they would develop a fingerprint for how you drove. I am here to tell you people do not drive the same way forever. There's a, everyone knows this, but there's, not, there's no real safe driver or not safe driver. Context matters a ton. Context matters tremendously, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But just to give you a little sense of, of who we are and what we do, I'm curious if anyone in the room is one of our customers. So does anyone um, have an insurance policy that actually gives you discounts based on how you drive from a mobile app? We have work to do. We have work to do. Thank you. Thank you. This is like the number one community that should be here. So at a very minimum, I'll save you money today. So the insurance industry is giving $4 billion, $4 billion in incentives to individuals directly that opt into these programs. These programs are mobile apps that people download on their phones, and they're from all the brands you see here. We work with nine of the top 10, 21 of the top 25. But I'm not here to talk about insurance. I'm talking about using mobility data for good. So this data that is being originated from these programs, of which I'm sure we'll get more today, because all of you will call your insurance company and save money. Like for example, Nationwide here in the front gives you 15% discount just for signing up. So 15% on annual basis. So just add that up on a regular element. And, and if you don't know, insurance is going up very aggressively because the roads are getting worse. And as a result of that, you have to charge more. So 
what can we do? So one of our goals as a company and our mission is to make the world's roads and drivers safer. So we started with the ability to understand and identify risk for the purposes of the insurance industry, but our expansion into different areas has helped us understand road risk in a much better way. And so we're gathering data from a number of sources. Some of our programs use an IoT device that sticks to the window like a toll transponder. It's about half of our data comes from there. The other half comes from mobile apps by themselves. And uh, we're also taking data from a number of different sources that are coming in, but the majority today or historically has been through an IoT device that is stuck into the windshield um, or uh, from smartphone. And they pair together and give us information on various, um, various uh, sensors, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, GPS, barometer, proximity sensor, and ambient light. And as a result of that, we can create risk scores, we can help in crashes, we can automate a crash reconstruction, and afterwards I'll show you a report, I don't have it in here. And really most importantly, most, most, most importantly, we can actually change behavior. And we have documented evidence of it, it's been studied, hopefully there's more to it, but we truly actually change behavior. So when we talk about distracted driving uh, from our perspective, we do it in multiple different vectors, but most of the data that you're gonna see today is talking about the screen state is on, on a phone, that the driver's moving more than 10 miles an hour, and they're interacting with their phone. But in the same way, we can also detect tapping. So if a phone is mounted, if a phone is mounted to uh, adhere to a hands-free law in a certain state, we can determine that the vehicle is moving and the driver is interacting with a phone while uh, the screen state is on. What's not considered distracted driving by our measurement is things like if you have a uh, navigation app open or if you have music open, if there's communication happening between the phone, that's not considered distracted driving. We do, however, have the ability to analyze phone call state and that is in our report as well. So if you're curious to see what's happening with handheld or hands-free phone calls, as I think one of, the, uh, one of the previous discussions was on, this is in our report. We'll have that afterwards at, um, at uh, I think, our table at the Technology Showcase. But the, the use case, the reason that people use our technology, everyone that uses our technology knows they're using our technology. So only the people that raise their hand in this room are in this data set. So there's no surreptitious data collection. It doesn't come from places that people don't know. So from a privacy perspective, everyone interacts with it. But it may shock you to know there's millions of drivers that use this today and continues to grow at an incredibly rapid rate. The real issue is getting more people to know about it. And when people know about it, they opt in at a pretty high rate because the insurance industry is giving huge incentives. And this is just a general idea of some of those elements, some of the ways that that comes in. But um, I'm gonna talk about something more important than the actual application technology for a moment. This is the data. So when I talk about the components of how we're coming at this, know that every single one of our customers in the insurance space has to file their rating algorithm methodology with every single one of their regulators. And they're regulated on a 50 state basis. So when they use our technology, they need to bring it to their regulators to be scrutinized and analyzed. And every single time they make changes to it, they have to do the same thing. So they are basing billions of dollars of premium on capabilities that are measured from here. So know that when the insurance industry is talking about this and the data that's being corresponded back to this, the actions are corresponded to losses. So you think about uh, the, the amount of, of insight that comes from that data, it's incredible because these are behaviors of individuals. It's effectively the world's largest naturalistic driving study that's running every day, every single day. And insurance companies are incentivized to know which behaviors are causing losses or not because they're putting their money behind it. They're putting billions of dollars behind it. Nationwide, it's 15%, progressive 15%, State Farm 10%, that's just the start. In some of those cases, it goes up to 30, 40, or 50% discounts on a uh, annual or six month basis. So these, these data points are corresponding to, to adverse events in the case of the individual. And one of those is absolutely distracted driving. And for years, for years, the insurance industry knew this before everyone else because they're seeing it. And in fact, it's in rating programs of a number of companies now, it's not in all of them, but a number of companies are pricing you depending on how much distracted driving you engage with on your phone. But we know, we know when the driver crashes as well. So we get a detection of that and we're sending emergency help to the scene when somebody gets into a crash. It's probably the most impactful thing of anyone that's in that world that has the ability to know that otherwise of this you know, simple technology, you wouldn't have known that crash occurred and getting people there. And interestingly enough, uh, my sister was fine, but she was just in a crash where this happened. 
And um, to see this capability of being able to emergency respond to, uh, to individuals, it's incredible. But it also gives you this picture of what happened before the crash. And in this case, we're looking at 34% of the crashes that, uh, that we detect had drivers holding their phone in the time span of one minute prior to that crash happening. That's amazing when you think about that, right? That's somebody holding their phone in their hand. 34% of the crashes. Corresponds very interestingly to the data that was talked about before. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion about what's happening, and this is kind of set up as a clock to give you a sense. Hopefully you can see. This is where distracted driving minutes per drive hour have been. 2020, it was one minute and 47 seconds average on a trip. In 2021, it went up to one minute and 58 seconds average on a trip. And in 2022, two minutes and 12 seconds. And we are all here to try to do something about this, and the clock is going in the other direction. So the first thing that I hope everyone understands here is we have to turn back the clock. Like, this is going to continue. There's no reason. There's no reason whatsoever to think it's going to abate. There's some, there's some good things that are happening, though. And Jennifer and Steve and, and everyone in the advocacy community are doing serious, amazing work. Just last uh, three weeks ago, the state of Ohio, thanks to the work of Nationwide, of Jennifer, of Steve, and so many other people, passed a law that improved hands-free. This is so important. We then were able to take the data on thousands and thousands and thousands of drivers, and in, in, in this community, basically real time, um, we were able to analyze this and determine what actually happened as a result of this law. So if there's any question whether or not that passes that law works, it's very clear. It absolutely is. And because we know which behaviors lead to crashes, we know that this prevented 300 crashes, basing the data of what causes crashes and the prevalence of the behavior, and now we've reduced that prevalence. So this is immediate. So now, you know, you don't, can't prove the negative, but we can see the data overall and how significant this is. The challenge is, how do you actually sustain this over time? And I'm going to give you more data on this, and by the way, on the, the previous um, slide, um, it's great to get the word out. So this data was published yesterday. And uh, we, had, uh, um, we had sent this into the State Department of Transportation in Ohio, and the governor had tweeted it out. And at that time that I looked at it, 58,000 people saw that. So now we'll see if that reinforces it. So now all of a sudden, you know, the social norms of this, and by the way, nobody paid a fine. Nobody paid a fine yet on any of these. This is all just educational. But it's, it's impactful education. So we know, and we can actually go back through, the Ohio Department of Transportation can go back through and look and see, like they can look to see what happened. And we're doing this on the aggregate. But when you start to actually think about the components and the ability to actually understand at the, at the actual intervention level, you can start to do amazing things. This is just to give you a, a simple idea. This is just looking at back to school, right? Anyone have kids that walk to school, ride bikes, whatever. Right, this is looking at distraction during back to school. This is super aggregated, right? So you can't really get a, a general picture of this, but just start to think about what's happening. You continue to see distracted driving rise. This is in, uh, I think it's the August to September timeframe, but you could look at this at an individual area. But let's go back to the laws for a second. So we have been very fortunate that there's been a number of laws that have been implemented over the last few years, looking at Rhode Island, Georgia, Tennessee, Minnesota, and now we actually, that's the pre-COVID era. And then Massachusetts, Idaho, Virgin, uh, Idaho, Indiana, and Virginia. And in every case, except for one, it either stayed the same or went down. And Massachusetts went up. Massachusetts, I know this one very well because I worked on this with Emily Stein from, um, uh, from Massachusetts as well. We were on local radio talking about this February 26th or 27th, 2020. Anyone know what happened two weeks later, right? So this is an amazing natural experiment to look at what happened in Massachusetts. There was no change in destructive driving in Massachusetts from that, from that bill at that time. Rhode Island also didn't change, but that's another reason behind this. The question is, how long does it stay? This is looking at that we, we freeze distracted driving as we've measured it at the time the law goes into effect. And then we just looked at it at Q4. So I just showed you the clocks before. Everywhere it's going up, right? So anywhere that it is not going up, anywhere, any state that stays flat on the zero, they're at least winning against the tide. They're at least winning against the tide. That's not enough, though. That's definitely not enough. You guys didn't sign up to win against the tide. We, we signed up to make real progress. 
This is looking at Q4 2022 versus where it was prior to that. Rhode Island actually had great results. Initially, they did not kick off very well. They, they, had, they kind of stayed in, in neutral for a while. Unfortunately, in Tennessee, and I don't know whether the rest aren't showing up, but in Tennessee, and I think it's Georgia, and Virginia's at the end. Uh, we'll make sure you get all the data on the slides here. But um, in those other states, they've gone backwards. So it's definitely Georgia, definitely Tennessee, Virginia's at the end. They're going backwards. So the law, in, in fact, in the state of Georgia, I think prevalence increased 78% with 195,000 convictions over the same period of time. So, you know, this is an absolute crisis. So we cannot just say we pass the law and walk away. And luckily, the people that are, are driving this know this, right? And this community is so passionate. And there are so many smart people in here. So what we have is we have a lot of analysis. This is, this is just published last week, last week, 60 pages. It goes into incredible depth. It's on our website, cmt.ai. If you're here, we have physical copies, but cmt.ai, you can get it now, or you can just come up and get it. But this data is available at aggregate levels to start and it's hopefully can spur some thoughts to get some ideas of what we can do to change this. I just want to give you one other research idea behind this. And this is looking at um, electric vehicles. This is looking at individuals that have an electric vehicle and that also have an internal combustion engine vehicle. This is the kind of research you can start to do to look and analyze the actual impact of the vehicle and the systems that vehicle has on the individual and how that individual acts in different vehicles. And in this case, we've looked at an individual that had Teslas, um, a Porsche, any hybrid, a Honda. In the case of an individual with an ICE vehicle and an EV, when they drove their EV, their, in this case the Tesla, their crash rate was 48% less. When they drove their other vehicle, their other vehicle was a Porsche, by the way, they crashed at 55% more. So this is just an idea, I'm not saying that Teslas are safe or not safe. We're all saying is if you have two different vehicles, what the impact is. That's the kind of research that can be done at scale behind this. And I mentioned changing behavior. This is a study that was published last year. This was initially work um, that came out of UPenn and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And they were looking at the ability to influence teen drivers specifically. And could you get reductions in distracted driving minutes per drive hour? And in fact, you could. So this, they saw a 25% reduction. And if you go back to the laws, there's nobody that has a sustained 25% reduction. So we need a holistic solution that takes in all the capabilities. But in this case, these technologies can work. Also can look at the impact of enforcement. <coughs> this is studied in uh, proceedings in the National Academy of Science. This is um, with Stanford's Computational Policy Lab and looking at traffic stops and uh, trying to determine if traffic stops are happening in areas of prevalence or if they're happening in areas that have something else happening, something else uh, that is driving traffic stops that go beyond the level of prevalence when compared to another neighborhood. Very interesting study, very interesting study because it looks across, I think it's 16 cities and it's not universal. You don't have the same effect in all the cities, but it starts to give you a view of, of all the intervention methods that we're engaging in. One of the things that, that we feel very excited about is the ability to actually change driver behavior, right? And you think about the teenage group is a great example. We did a program with um, Oklahoma called Oklahoma Challenge. Wonderful woman there, Linda Terrell, that is pulling this by you know, the skin of her teeth. She is amazing, truly passionate person. She should be in this room, actually. And this is not studying that case, but it's looking at a number of different elements that have rewards. So drivers that get rewards, if it came from their insurance company or somewhere else, but you actually see a 14 point difference in risk. A 14 point difference in risk. And we see this in distracted driving too. So this is engaged drivers. So picture this, right? I'm gonna talk about this outside of this issue, but picture you, uh, a scale doesn't exist. And all of a sudden you give a person a scale and every day they step on the scale, they start to see feedback to whatever the thing is that they're doing, this is exactly it. We're showing drivers their trips. So people that come in and look at their trips get safer. And we've studied this a number of times. This is in an app. Every single time they drive, they get a notification, they get a score, looking at their distraction, their speeding, heart braking, acceleration. And it turns out that if you go in and look, you get better. If you don't look, just measuring by itself doesn't do enough, right? If you had a, a monitoring system that didn't give feedback, then all it does is just measure. It's not enough. So, the really important thing is engaged drivers are less distracted. So if we can get drivers to come back in to look at their behavior, we know we can reduce that. 
And because this is a constant issue, it's not like a seatbelt where you just get in the car and just put it on. It's not like impairment where it happens around specific windows of time. This is constant. This is absolutely constant. So this is one of those things that we know that we can do something about, that we're really, really excited about. This, is, uh, this has happened uh, in the public sector. We did safest driver competitions in cities of Boston, San Antonio, with LA and Seattle. And it was studied by the Federal Highway Administration. And again, in the same case, the same effect always happens, always, always, always happens. The worst drivers, bottom quartile, bottom 25%, improve by almost 50% the distraction. So these are the individuals that are most at risk of crashing. These are the individuals that are most at risk of crashing. So all this data is available, and I'll leave with these elements, these action steps. Number one, we can absolutely use telematics to analyze prevalence. We've, we're doing it now at scale. And just so you know, generally speaking, we've scored over 25 million drivers. It's you know, around 9 million drivers a month, 9, 10 million drivers a month are being measured. So this is, the scale is, is, is significant. Is it every driver? No, because only the people that opted into these programs are being analyzed. But that's for a variety of different reasons. Discounts on insurance, crash detection, save money on fuel, those concepts. We think that we can analyze current interventions to understand what works and what doesn't. As I just mentioned before, you could look at uh, really anywhere, uh, generally speaking, and get a picture of risk that could develop right outside. In fact, we're looking at DC right now. We're looking at interventions that could be applied. So we're getting a baseline of prevalence. You put an intervention in and you know what's happening there. This is happening in real time in Ohio. Every single week we're going to be publishing on what's happening in Ohio. So as soon as it starts to slip, we're going to raise the alarm. There's not going to be any hiding. We think highway safety plans need to incorporate this data. Highway safety plans cannot be based on uh, information from, um, from just fatalities alone. They're too infrequent relative to the amount of time that the behaviors are occurring, and they're not connecting, back to, uh, not connecting back to the interventions. And just to be completely clear, as I just said that, one fatality is too frequent, but it's not enough for us to make policy based on fatalities alone. And last is launch interventions that work. And we're really excited about more of those to come. The safest driver programs are some. The insurance industry is doing tremendous work. AARP just launched a program uh, a few weeks ago, and they're uh, designing a program for, for um, their members and their drivers to help educate. We're doing more programs with teen drivers, but there's more out there. But the data is the number one message, hopefully, you take away is we don't have to be, uh, we don't have to be blind to this issue. It is, it is, it is significant. And we can, I think the biggest thing that's challenging, and Jennifer sees this all the time, is people are saying, well, it's only X relative to other things. It's only X. It's not. Absolutely not, and we can help hopefully put a microscope to an issue that in the past has been dealt with with an abacus. So, thank you. As I load this up, I mean, thank you very much for inviting me uh, here today. Hopefully, you'll all be able to understand me through my deep, deep South accent. Uh, so I'm Alex Yannick. I'm the founder and the managing director of AccuCensus. I founded AccuCensus to address the scourge of distracted driving. I founded it in 2018, so it's about five years old now. One of the major reasons that AccuCensus exists uh, is because my friend James was cycling in a bike lane in LA uh, and he was run over from behind, killed by a driver who was impaired and was texting. Uh, so AccuCensus now has about 120 employees. It's publicly listed. It's got offices in Australia, in the US, in the UK. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit about the world first jurisdiction to implement full enforcement against distracted driving and how it is, by US standards, eliminated distracted driving by mobile phone use. So I'll take you through the technology, three different ways to apply it, how it can be applied in the US right now. So uh, this driver was, obviously he's got two hands on his cell phone, uh, traveling about 55 or 60 miles per hour. This is happening all day, every day across the road networks. The technology that we've developed can take this very clear prosecutable photograph through a windshield, eliminate the glare, can operate absolutely any time of day, 
and can then automatically detect the driver and work out whether they're using a mobile phone, sorry, a cell phone, or, or not. Uh, I'll take you through some of the other applications of that technology as well. So the way that this is deployed is most commonly on a trailer-based platform. So really that anywhere, anytime concept. So you have to get cameras right up high, that's on the, the boom arm up here. Um, so you get a camera here and a camera here that can monitor each lane and they'll get that uh, data of somebody who's texting and that kind of you know, below the dashboard style behavior. Um, the systems will also got cameras down here and that's for um, phone to ear style behavior. That's about 5% of phone uh, usage from what we see uh, overseas and 95% is really this kind of you know, manipulative behavior. Um, so this, these platforms have been deployed now in five continents. So we haven't cracked South America or Antarctica yet, but the other five continents uh, have experienced this kind of technology. So we have data sort of right from across the world here. To touch a little bit on the artificial intelligence, I'd encourage you to go to our, our YouTube channel and you can see our CTO, Chris Kells, explain exactly how this works with a demonstration. And also, if you visit our booth today, you can um, get a greater appreciation of this. But basically, we're automatically finding a driver and then assessing, are they illegally touching a mobile phone? So that's, you know, they've got it in their hand. In some jurisdictions, they've got it on their lap. Um, importantly, if it's in a cradle, then we're excluding that automatically, for example, because that's legal in most jurisdictions. Um, Privacy is extremely important to us because any enforcement program has to have very high public support. And we know that's a major issue for the public. So we don't store any images of drivers. Um, that was a major challenge for us because we have to develop an artificial intelligence system without storing a big data set for it. Um, but we were able to accomplish that. And the only things that even police or authorities can see is if somebody's actually offending. If a driver's not offending, then any imagery is just instantly deleted. And so no human can ever see that kind of stuff. Uh, this technology has been expanded to address simultaneously distraction, seatbelt usage, um, point speeding, and also average speeding, uh, and other license plate based infractions. So when you combine all that together, a government can deploy a single asset and be addressing the underlying cause of two in three road fatalities. So the big missing one there is impairment, so alcohol and drugs. We're working on that. It's not available yet, though. So here in the US, we've deployed these systems now across 18 different states, just in a data gathering scenario. And so data gathering is the first step. So sort of building on the work of my colleagues here, it's an ability to go out anywhere <coughs> on the road network and survey what is the, the behavior, how many people are distracted right there and then, and this is an opt-in. This is every single driver going past is tested. So you have the full ground truth of that. Um, we can also tell are they simultaneously distracted and not wearing a seatbelt, simultaneously distracted and speeding and get those kinds of statistics. Um, I think interesting and just following up exactly from what Ryan said, um, hands-free laws from what we've seen, this is not statistically significant. I do have to say that first. But from what we've seen, do have an impact. So the work that you're doing um, is absolutely saving lives. Um, and now it's how do we get better, even better than that. So up here, we see one in 10 drivers going past one of our systems uh, in a phone use permitted state. Uh, one in 10 will be actively using a mobile phone. If the state has a, a texting ban, it's barely any change. If the state has a full hands-free law in place, then they're down at that's a 7.5% level. I want to just, before I get onto the policing application, I want to take you through a case study from Missouri. So we were asked to go and deploy at this roadworks site and we were told there were multiple crashes a day occurring at this site. And like, multiple a day, how is that even possible? Um, found very high levels of speeding, very high levels of distraction and of um, seatbelt use. But then what's also interesting for us is how many drivers are doing those things simultaneously? And so actually a, a significant number of drivers were offending on at least two and um, more than one in 200 were doing the trifecta. You know, not wearing a seatbelt, um, speeding significantly, you know, more than 10 miles an hour over in, in the work zone 
um, and using their mobile phone actively. And when we start going through the crash risks associated with each of those behaviours, if we're taking the, um, comparing it to the ideal driver, you know, you've got the four times elevated crash risk for the mobile phone use, eight times elevated death risk for not wearing the seatbelt, four times more crash risk associated with the speeding, a lot of extra energy to dissipate in a, in a collision. And so you've got this very small set of drivers that you could try and uh, introduce a targeted intervention to that have a 179 times elevated risk of death compared with the, you know, the sober, attentive driver. And so as we approach what we're doing in the United States, we're providing um, policing tools. So we're aiding law enforcement for how they can more effectively police this and very efficiently police this. And so we developed what was an automated enforcement system to what we call uh, heads up real time. And so that's where our trailer technology is deployed by the side of the road and it's done in conjunction with law enforcement. So if somebody's going to be offending, then an officer pulls that person over and can intervene, can talk to them. And that's you know, the most powerful form of education you, know, you can really have in comparison to trying to send something out in the mail. So to give you a sense of how that works, uh, in the bottom left, you've got Jack. You can meet Jack at two o'clock today. So he's using his phone there on private property on a closed ride. Um, and then he drives past the trailer system, uh, which then right there and then works out, is he using the phone? Is he wearing a seatbelt? Is he speeding? Is he on a wanted list? So like that. Because he's offending for both mobile phone and for speed, the data on that is transmitted just through the cell phone network, so it's very easy for police to use, securely transmitted, uh, to the police officer. And so the police officer can then look at that and say, the officer gets ahead of time, hey, this vehicle's coming to me, you know, it's a grey Nissan Altima, um, he's using a cell phone, he's speeding, here's the licence plate, and he's got two seconds until this vehicle arrives to him. So that's an actively calculated timer. So it's how, how much time until that vehicle gets to that officer. And so the officer can very efficiently go, OK, that is um, somebody that I really need to um, intervene to do a traffic stop to, to try and change this person's behavior. And something that comes up a lot in discussions in the United States is uh, the, the topic of equality. And I think it's important to recognise with this kind of technology, it's totally agnostic to what is the car, what is the driver, it doesn't operate that way. And so the technology is just getting your absolute base usage. Who is illegally using something? Who is not obeying the law? And then importantly, it can also provide a record so that you could then audit and make sure the traffic stops that were conducted, you could prove that that was a fair and equitable use of police officer time. Uh, and so just before I get on to automated enforcement, this has been done in real world active policing uh, in two states so far. We're in discussions with quite a few states about this at the moment, which is really encouraging. This was the first time that this technology went, went public. It was the end of 2018. And that's, we were able to successfully convince the New South Wales Government of Australia to um, test it and then adopt full automated enforcement program. Um, so this program got enormous press coverage right across the world. I think we got above Donald Trump one day on that, on, on CNN. Um, and so the, the government introduced this, this program. I'm going to tell you what kind of impact this had. The day that they introduced it, to, to your point, and said, you are all being enforced. Stop using your mobile phones over there, not cell phones, mobile phones, um, the prevalence rate pretty much halved instantly. You know, because people are scared about getting a ticket. It's expensive over there, 250 US dollars in New South Wales. So for context, New South Wales has Sydney as its capital. It's the most populous state in Australia, has about eight or nine million people living in it, has a huge and vast road network. It is in many ways actually quite similar to many states across the US. Um, two thirds of fatalities are rural and regional. In, in New South Wales. Over time, as we deployed 10 
enforcement systems, 20 enforcement systems, the rate of people using their cell phones dropped and dropped and dropped. It's a six times reduction in mobile phone use across that state. That state used to be middle of the pack in Australia. There's eight states and territories. It was in the middle in terms of road fatalities per annum, um, per 100,000. It is now the safest road network in Australia. It has 3.3 road fatalities per 100,000. For context in the US, depending which state you're in, that will be somewhere in the 10 to 15 range. On this graph, in orange is Australian road fatalities apart from New South Wales. As you've seen here, increasing road fatalities over the last few years, 8% increase from when New South Wales started their program. So in the blue line is New South Wales road fatalities. Program started down, 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 down. It's 20% reduction in road fatalities very quickly. And that has been sustained. So that's where you could get to. If, and the technology is available today. I think of the, was it, if I take the $92.2 billion cost over here of distraction, you know, you could save $92.1 billion of that just by doing enforcement, full enforcement across all 50 states. Of course, that will take political courage to get that across the line. But you look at overall prevalence, same graph I had before with the three categories for the US. That's where New South Wales is now, after they've been enforced. So a massive change in behavior. And so if you just run through those numbers, four times risk of crashing and probably dying or causing a death, if you're using a your mobile phone, your cell phone, just run through those numbers. If you were able to actually enforce actively all of those hands-free laws and get them across the line, you get a 22% reduction in fatalities, which is almost 10,000 people every year with a technology that can be adopted straight away. So thank you very much for your attention. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we are past 1 o'clock over time, but I do want to open the room up for some questions in case there's anyone that uh, wants to ask a question to this group of panelists. If not, I do want to ask one question myself, then we'll go to lunch. But uh, someone over there brought up a really good question of how to educate teenage drivers. And I felt that that question would have been really good to ask a, to this panel, given the real-time nature of your data. Um, any thoughts? You know, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen driving games at all, like driving video games, but there's in the licensing process and that you have to get a license to go up to different um, levels of uh, the class of vehicle. And it's actually pretty sophisticated and fun. There's a couple of different platforms out there, Forza from Microsoft. Um, I'm trying to think of one of the other ones, but uh, if you get your license in the United States, um, you have a certain number of hours you get supervised, and then if you have a graduated license, graduated licensing program, then you're you know you're free to go within those parameters, and then afterwards it's you know free for all. And we have the technology now that we could actually do something about that. You could actually train a driver in the same methodology that they could train on a video game, but in real life. So spend a certain number of hours driving in this type of situation. Spend a certain number of hours driving this kind of situation. You don't have to rely on mom or dad, or you don't have to rely on you know, somebody that may be willing to spend the time. You could actually do this from technology. You could have this be enabled right through an app, and you could have this in the vehicle itself, right? This could be integrated into that experience. So I think that's the, to me, that's the future. And I think hopefully that's the, that's the direction that we, we all move in at some point is that we actually you know, understand what things need to be done to actually train individuals and train them in methodologies that are going to be most impactful to their real life situation as opposed to kind of the standardized approach to the way that we have had to before. It's not because we didn't want to, it's just because how else would you have done it before? So I think that's my view, good question. Anyone else want to add? Anyone else want to add? Or? Okay, well. Any other questions? How about, 
Okay, Steve, you want to come up? And go ahead and wrap up. And on. Well, I'm going to say thanks, everyone. We're wrapping up this panel, and we'll get to lunch soon. I'll be brief. Is, it, oh, is this on? Can, is this on? Yeah. Are we good? Good, good. Okay. Um, hey, I'll be brief because um, I know everyone's hungry and it's time for lunch. But um, first, let me just say I am overwhelmed by the presentations that we saw uh, today from all of the speakers. Um, I try to pride myself in being knowledgeable on this uh, topic, and I'm embarrassed at how um, knowledgeable I'm not after seeing what I just saw today. Can I have just another round of applause for everyone that spoke? I'm, I'm floored by it. Um, a quick, uh, and we're not done yet because we're going to have lunch and then we're going to see technology later and, and Jennifer's going to walk us through it. I do need to say, though, um, a special um, thank you and apology. A thank you to Jennifer and to uh, Mary Blinas for the work that went into putting this together. I'm, I'm amazed at what you've been able to pull off, and not just today, but for all the work you've done over your last 15 years or more. The quick apology is um, Jennifer first told me about this in December, and um, she said, we're going to do this big thing in April in D.C., and I said, Jennifer, it's December. Um, you don't have a date yet. You don't have a venue. You don't have people lined up. I don't think you're actually going to do it. I've known Jennifer for about five or six years now. I should learn to stop doubting you because I don't know how you pulled all this off, but again, I, I'm just amazed at what you... So apologies that I had doubts, but this is great, and I can't wait to see how much better it is uh, next year. So I'm going to finish with just a couple of challenges, quick challenges. Um, I, I made... These are all my notes here, and uh, I, I, uh, I want to talk with all of you about them uh, during, the, during the session when we're looking at technology. But I want to throw out just a couple of challenges because I'm kind of a challenge guy. And a couple of them are easy, and a couple get a little bit harder. First of all, do not disturb mode. The next time we talk, can everybody put their hand up that you've got that enabled on your phone? You, this group has to, every one of you, every one of your children, every one of your family members, get that done. That has to be done. Second, I would challenge you on those um, safe driving apps. Get a hold of your insurance company. If they're not giving you 15 to 30% reduction for implementing the app and driving safe, find a new insurance company. You saw a list of them uh, from, uh, from Ryan. It, it, we, we need, uh, you need to use those. They're great, and uh, make sure your family's using those as well. That's an easy one. Um, third, how many members of the National Distracted Driver Coalition do we have in the room right now? All right, so by the end of the day, you're all members of the coalition, so we'll make sure we figure out how to do that, but we need every one of you to be part of the coalition and actually be active participants. If you can't do it yourself, make sure you send someone from your organization. And I'll go one step further. When you become an active participant, please take a challenge to bring one more organization with you that's not here today. You mentioned the DMV. You, mentioned there's, you all have great ideas on others that could benefit from that. Let's double it and bring someone else. Uh, the fourth thing I listed, I can't even read my own writing, but it was really smart. Um, <laughs> ah, when we do get feedback from all of you, I would really be interested in just at least one idea that you came up with based on what you heard today. I probably have 25 here, so if you need help, let me know. But one idea that can help us bring an end to distracted driving based on what you heard today. Let's get them documented. And then I'm going to challenge us to get to some kind of platform. I don't know what you all use. Back at General Motors, we used to use iHub as an uh, as a, uh, idea sharing tool where you could basically solve complex problems. Uh, some companies, some startups use Slack. I don't know what the right uh, mechanism is. But I would propose that we get something going where we can start sharing ideas, making sure that we're all interactive and working on this problem. And then the last thing I need to clarify, I threw a challenge out earlier because I'm not shy with challenges. Earlier, I said 25% reduction in crashes and fatalities by the end of the decade. I think I might have flipped it at the end and said 50%, which is good as well. But I would just say right now, let's come up with a way to really put initiatives in place to bring crashes and fatalities down by the end of this decade by 20, 25%. And that will be one of the challenges that uh, I'm going to personally work on with all of you. Let's find the initiatives. We have all the support from smart people in this room. We'll get the auto industry involved. We'll get the phone companies involved. We'll get legislators and all the other organizations that are going to be part of our coalition, coalition. And let's get this done so that your families are safe. Jennifer, please tell us what we're doing next. Thank you all. Thank you so much for sticking around. I know you're all probably ready to pass out from hunger. So you can go grab a bite to eat. The showcase will still start at 2 o'clock. It's going to be down on the first floor lobby in the solarium. 
and then you walk through the solarium and then we'll have another display outside. I want to mention that Magna and Seeing Machines will be together near the, that car outside because their technologies work together. And if you had questions for these guys up here, please go down there and talk more, talk to each other. Let, let's find these solutions. Thank you.